a, an agenda that people can collect outside as well? Stink.
Good morning. Welcome to the first FIFA Women's Football and Women in Leadership conference here at the home of FIFA in Zurich. Thank you to those of you who've joined us here in person, including the uh, FIFA President Sepp Blatter and the FIFA General Secretary Jerome Valk. And uh, great to see so many people, not just here, but we know that there are plenty of people joining us from around the world on the internet, on FIFA.com and the FIFA YouTube channel. My name's Jackie Oatley, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's conference. I'm a broadcast broadcaster from the UK, mostly for the BBC, partly for ITV as well. I tend to present football programmes, which is quite a nice job to have. Uh, it's not something that I've always done. I changed career a few years ago from doing something that I didn't want to do, and now I'm one of the luckiest people around being able to watch football for a living. Of course, there have been a few barriers along the way. Not everybody wants to uh, see somebody or hear somebody talking about football from a female persuasion, but I think things are certainly changing. And also in the world of women's football, I cover men and women's football, and I've done women's football for 11 years now, and certainly between then and and now there's been great progress made in the women's game. But of course, as we'll discover and, and talk about today in some detail, there is quite a long way to go. Now, today is all about creating a platform here at the heart of global football for an open, honest debate about what can be done to further develop women's football across the whole world and to create more opportunities for women in leadership, both in football and in wider society. It's about listening, about sharing, about learning from a, a diverse array of, of speakers who will hear from today in the auditorium. And also from those of you watching on the live stream on the internet around the world, we'll be taking questions from people on Twitter. And as part of its aims for the conference, FIFA says it's committed to improving the way it works as an institution and also as a global football community. We'll be hearing from top FIFA officials about their work in developing women's football around the world and what the institution's doing to empower more women in football in this, the year of the FIFA Women's World Cup. Today, we'll provide plenty of food for thought. We'll have some concrete ideas and suggestions to add further momentum for positive change in football and elsewhere. We'll have an impressive lineup of speakers, as you'll see in due course, and panelists to guide us through the topics and to drive the debate. We have people drawn from the world of football, from sport as a whole, from business and beyond those boundaries, focusing on women's football in the morning and women in leadership in the afternoon. But first, to officially open the conference, on behalf of FIFA, I'd like to welcome to the stage the FIFA president, Mr. Sepp Blatter. It is uh, really a great day for uh, women's football today. And uh, it is uh, my honor, my pleasure, uh, to welcome you all to this first FIFA's Women's Football and Leadership Conference. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are confident that you will find this day constructive and informative as a platform for open, honest debate about how we develop women's football further and how we improve opportunities for women in leadership in football and beyond. It's also inspiring uh, so we can work with renewed purpose, objectives, to create a fairer and better world. Don't forget our slogans, develop the game, touch the world, and prepare a better future. This shall also be in this special conference. FIFA's primary mission is very clear. As I just said, to develop football everywhere and for all. Football is for all. And all for football. It's a game for everyone. No matter who you are, 
no matter where you are from. That is the spirit, and this makes our game so universal. It's a universal language, football. And this vision is anchored or enshrined in our statutes. And it is supported by regulations, by the work of our member associations, by the confederations, especially now by the task force for women's football, but also by the task force against racism and discrimination. It forms the foundation of uh, everything this organization does through football. Women's football is one of the key elements in my personal program. And uh, women's football is developing quickly. We can say now that more than 30 million girls and women play the game all around the world. It is now our duty to drive this growth to its full potential so that every girl and woman has the opportunity to play and to participate in football. Play and participate. As FIFA, it is our duty to make sure that there is equal opportunities for all across our member associations. By the way, we came, or we have come, a long way since staging our first international women's tournament in 1988. And it was only in the Congress in 1986 in Mexico that we were bitterly reprimanded by a delegate of uh, Norway by saying to the, at that time, president, there is only a very, very, very small mention of women's football in your activity report. And then at that time, the president, Joa Havelange, he said, lady, but this is the report of the secretary general, so ask him what to do. I was the secretary general. And I tell you, I took it up, this challenge that was made to me in 1986. So we have started the International Women's Tournament, the first one in 1988. We had the first Women's World Cup in 1991. And therefore, we have started with women's football development programs all over the world. Our slogan, Leave Your Goals, is a campaign in over 50 countries last year, this year, and we stage a full range of sexual, successful youth and senior women's tournament. Just have a look on the results on this famous tournament, women's tournament played actually in the Algarve. I am sure that somebody will give the results later on. But this is a small World Cup with two groups by four uh, playing uh, there as every year in Portugal. Is there anybody from Portugal here today? No, yes, one young lady here, Julia. Thank you. So uh, taking the uh, development of women's football very seriously, we have a long-term commitment by FIFA's by FIFA's executive committee, by the different committees. So we have doubled the investments in women's football in the, for the years 2015 and 2018. We are helping our national associations to develop uh, football, women's football. And in the development of women's football, please do not forget one thing which is so important. There are still, of, out of the 209 associations, members of FIFA. Everybody is playing women's football. Some in closed circuit, doesn't matter, but they play football. But what is important, that we must have leagues in the different associations, and not only national teams. This will be one of the items in this uh, famous uh, task force uh, we have now put on uh, in uh, exercise or in function in FIFA. We have uh, 
created position or we like to create position of a woman in the FIFA executive committee. But ladies and gentlemen, this was a hard work. This was a hard work because the members of FIFA's executive committee are elected by the national associations in their congresses. And in their congresses, there was never, never a proposal for a woman uh, to be finally in FIFA. So we had to take the decision, and I did it in 2011 at the end of the Congress. I said we must have at least one woman in the executive committee of FIFA. We have one, but only one because it's the Congress. In the other confederation, there's no movement in this macho sport. Uh, that's, uh, that's a pity, that's a pity. But we should change, perhaps in the future, we will have another look how we can have a better representation. But anyway, the lady that has been elected, uh, she is with us today, Lydia Neskera, she will speak later on. I'm very happy to welcome you specifically and specially because you are the first lady in our executive committee, the first woman in the executive committee. Thank you. By the way, she, is, uh, she has also a position. She's a member of the IOC. And in the IOC, she's also the chair of all women uh, organizations. I think this is great. This is great. Well, what shall we do more to empower the leadership and administration? Because on one side, what we have to do is to develop the game. On the other side, we shall develop uh, equally also a, a, a definitive, a positive change in society. You remember, or all those, they have been following women's football when we played the second World Cup, 1995, in Sweden. I had at that time a very, I would say, a very risky, but who never takes a risk will never have a chance. I have a slogan, and I said at the end of the competition, the future of football will be feminine. I was right, because at that time we played with 12 teams, the World Cup. There was no other competition in FIFA. Now we have the under-17, we have the under-20, we have Olympic football tournament, and this year we will have in Canada for the first time we will have a 24-team World Cup, Women's World Cup, 24 teams. This is uh, 52 matches, 52 matches in more than three weeks all around this big country, the second biggest country in the world, Canada. And this will be, this will be a milestone. And this year, okay, there are, uh, don't forget, we have under 20 and under 17 uh, men's football or boys' football, uh, one, the under-20 in uh, New Zealand, and in the under-17 in, uh, in um, Chile. We will have uh, beach soccer only for men for the time being in uh, Portugal. We will have the World Club competition in uh, Japan. But the focus and all what will be done in 2015 in FIFA with the partners, with the economic partners, with the media partners, is going to this 24-team World Cup in Canada. And it will, be, it will be extraordinary. I have spoken about uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Lydia Skara to be uh, the first woman that has been elected in FIFA. But we have two more of uh, these uh, um, I don't know why I should not use the name of ladies, but we have two more ladies in our executive committee. They are co-opted. They are in their second year of, of co-option. And one of them is here with us today, and you will have the opportunity to hear something from her, because she is also the chair, the chairwoman of the new task force for women football in FIFA, I welcome especially Maya Dot.
I, I forget to add that uh, uh, Lydia Skera is coming from Burundi in Africa, and the Maya Dot is coming from Australia, and we are waiting uh, from other continents as well, uh, such uh, exclusive women. The third one, but she's not here today, uh, is answering to the uh, absolutely famous name, uh, Sonia Bianemi, and she's uh, the chairwoman of a, of a federation, and uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, Turks and Caicos Federation in uh, the Caribbean. Uh, we have only two ladies chairing a, uh, an international federation of football, this macho football, as they say. Uh, the other one is also here with us, and uh, she is uh, the chairwoman of uh, a country that has been hit, but really hit, Sierra Leone. Aisha Johansson. Welcome, Aisha Johansson. <laughs> voilà, where we are. Uh, you will have, you will have a full day, a full day, and then one of the part of the days you are speaking football, the first part. The second part you are speaking leadership. And it was able for us uh, to organize the best possible speakers that we could find in uh, this context of women's football. But I'm very happy to see around uh, the participants also a lot of men. And I'm happy that you agreed, agreed that men will participate in uh, this uh, special day today. It's an important day because it shows uh, that uh, according also to our statutes of FIFA, we make no difference. We play football everywhere, and everybody can play football. We do not look at culture, at gender, at politics, or whatever. Football is for everybody. So I'm very happy that you are here. More than 30 million, more than 30 million girls and women, women are playing the game around the world. I'm sure there are more, but the statistics is uh, for men's football. We have more information on statistics. Please give us more statistics. Please give us more movements where women's football is played. It's great. And I will tell you also why, why there is uh, such a, an, uh, an, an, a movement towards women's football, because it is also the right of the girl to play a game, team sport. And in a team sport, what are the other team sports which would be convenient uh, for girls? I speak for the young girls. Baseball, uh, basketball, then volleyball, perhaps handball, but it's rough. But in uh, basketball and volleyball, if you are not tall, like my daughter, she started in volleyball, but she played under the net. So, and this, and this is not exactly, this is not exactly uh, what is the aim in competition sport. But in football, in our game, association football, everybody can play. And you don't need to be tall. You can have all aspects, physical aspects, you can play. And this makes this sport so attractive. And then, what is more attractive then? It's the ball. There is no other item in the world, the ball. But not the ball to play by hand. That's easy. Because then you have, a, uh, yeah, it's easy to play the ball if you, but when you play football, it's not easy. You lose your equilibrium. As soon as you touch the ball, you are not any longer in equilibrium. And it is the game where you lose your equilibrium that is the most popular game in the world. I cannot explain it. Ask, uh, uh, let, let's say, our antique uh, parents and whatever, where they are coming from, how it's come. But I give you a message. I give you a message from Mr. From the Secretary General of uh, the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. He went to the international, to the session of the International Olympic Committee, where I represent football, and then all these Olympians with 27 
summer sports and seven winter sports and some others, they were awaiting that he's making a big compliments for one of the sports. They were all there. He said, he said, yes, the Olympic movement is a very important Olympic movement and all around the world they are in these different Olympic committees and movements. And then he go on and he said, but uh, when touring around the world and you are in a country, in a poor country, because so many poor countries in the world, and then you have young people, boys or girls, and you give them a, you just give them a ball, and then they are happy. They don't play handball. They just kick. Let them kick. Kicking a ball, football is the most popular game in the world. And all these Olympians, they were looking a little bit with envy and jealousy to the FIFA president. And what I said, I said, mm, and so what? <laughs> In the modesty, I have said I will not take more than that. With that, together with the Secretary General, uh, Jerome Balk, I have the honor uh, to open officially this first FIFA Women's Football and Leadership Conference on this day of the 6th of March here at the home of FIFA. And it's for the game, for the game, for the world, for women everywhere. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Blatter. Yes, now we know football is a proper sport, not like ones you play with your hands. Now, Mr. Blatter did introduce uh, Lydia and Sakira, so you probably know by now that she is the first female FIFA Executive Committee member, and she also chairs the FIFA Committee for Women's Football and the Women's World Cup, so she's got quite a busy year on. Lydia. Mr. President, Mr. General Secretary, ladies and gentlemen, here we are in the home of football to participate in this conference on women's football and women's leadership. But we all together, men and women, we celebrate the International Women's Day on 6 March. Since 95, the member nations of the United Nations, civil society, and other stakeholders, without forgetting the Olympic movement, the Olympic federations, we are here to eliminate discrimination against women and girls and have equality in all walks of life. The fourth conference on women that took place in Beijing in 95, signed the declaration and the action program Beijing 95. And here it was a matter of uh, making women more autonomous. It is a source of orientation, of inspiration for the equality of the genders and fostering the rights of women and the girls. We have 12 main subjects to worry about the power and the decision-making by women. In 95, the Olympic Committee made a official declaration on the position of uh, women in sports, encouraging women to become leaders. And the IOC decided that 20% of the decision-taking posts should be held by women. Today, 2015, women who are leaders in sports or leaders in other walks of life are not yet sufficiently numerous. It seems that the obstacles for women to access posts of responsibility are high, starting in international organizations, in governments and parliaments. So it's a matter of finding out how we can bring down the obstacles that keep women from reaching posts of responsibility. Nevertheless, women have an equal or higher level of education than men. 
And then there's also the question whether the difficulties we see in sports are proper to the IOC. But no, it is a problem in society. It is a pro problem all around the world. Now, what is happening elsewhere? The equality among men and women is far from being achieved. The social differences are marked by strong differences depending on the country and the region and also of the political representation and access to decision-making posts. According to the figures published in the legislative and political bodies, the share of women leaves much to be desired. In the parliaments in 2014, 20% of uh, the women of the members of parliament were women, but this is an increase. We have right now 15 heads of government and 10 heads of state who are women, and in 30 countries, women represent 10% of the members of parliament. That is in 2014. As to the other posts in government, only 17% in 2014 of the ministers and governments were women, having ministries that were related to the social sectors, education and health. Normally, the threshold for women is 30%. Only 39 countries have achieved that so far, 11 in Africa and 8 in Latin America, and 32 had applied a quota for women. And this was an opening for the participation of women. Corresponding to the level of education, women are still underrepresented in the public sector and international bodies and in sports. So what is happening in FIFA? What is happening in the national associations? There's a study of FIFA in 2014 on women in sports. We have... Um, 2% of uh, women in the executive committees, and in all the member countries in the executive committees, we have up to 8%. We have 7% women coaches, and uh, among referees, we have 10% of them women. So this means that among 209 associations, two are led by women. So. The question is the following. We have now two women, one woman in the executive committee of FIFA, two co-opted, and uh, nine programs for the development of women's football are being proposed within the context of leadership of women. Ladies and gentlemen, the IOC has coordinated a study within which women were as, as to their position in the Olympic Committee, National Olympic Committees, whether they had been in office or out of office or they had presented themselves unsuccessfully to elections. The specific quality of women as leaders in the financial world, social world, the self-confidence she has, all this is helpful if a woman wishes to accede to a higher post. And the social status and the experience also in business can give a woman sufficient self-esteem to present herself to elections. Do we have these women in football? I would like to call all women to get ready to work hard together with the men to overcome the existing obstacles. We don't want that the guidelines of an association are established only by men. We must have more women in the congresses of the association and in the Congress of FIFA. The problem we have and see cannot be handled by women who fight only for themselves. Cooperation with men is essential. Only together we can really make a step forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Lydia. Now, let's hear more on FIFA's efforts to support women's football. We'll hear in a moment from the former New Zealand captain, Rebecca Smith, who's now the women's competitions manager at FIFA. But first of all, let's hear from Maggi Cruz Blanco, who's a senior women's football development manager at FIFA. Maggi. Thank you, Jackie. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maggi Cruz Blanco, and I come from Cuba. Since I was a young girl, I practiced sport, and I dream about the world outside my little island. I had some moments when I even wondered if the outside really exists. Sport has given me the strength and the power to stand up for myself. It has led me to stand here today in front of you. And I am humbly honored with this opportunity. My daughter today told me that I was her idol. So I am living my dreams in all fronts. Working in football in the last seven years, I have met women around the world with powerful voices that needed to speak. I have met girls with great potential to become football stars. A significant growth of our sport will come from more women and girls joining football. They are essential for development. I believe in this, and the good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that I am counting with each one of you to achieve this. But I'm also counting with all of those that are following this conference today. We need as many as possible because the task that we have at hand is not an easy one. Despite progress over the last 20 years and being the FIFA Women's World Cup, the biggest female team sport in the world, we are yet to explore full potential of female participation. 30 million women and girls are participating in football. An impressive number. Out of 250 million, this is not enough for us. In 2014, we implemented a survey with the participation of 85% of our member associations. The figures on women participation are not encouraging yet. Out of all decision makers in football today, only 8% are female. Only 7% of registered coaches worldwide are female. Only 10% of registered female referees, only 10% of registered referees are female. These numbers need to grow. We must work together so that women and girls can join football and stay in the game as naturally as boys and men. As a key strategic development area for FIFA, our objectives for women's football are very ambitious. We would like to see that football continues to be number one female team sport around the world. Every woman and girl who wants to play football should have the opportunity to do so and in the best conditions. More women should be able to join football at all levels. And as it is the core of any sport, we need to have more sustainable and well-established competitions for women and girls around the world. But we cannot do this alone. FIFA cannot do this alone. We need to work together with our member associations. Women's football should be fully integrated into the strategy of all member associations. And their leadership need also to commit to this objective. Better governance means also that women are included, from the status to grassroots to elite to all the programs within our member associations. To work with our member associations and support their efforts, the FIFA Women's Football Task Force introduced 10 key principles. These 10 key principles were approved by the 64 FIFA Congress in 2014. 
The 10 key principles talk about, among other areas, about member associations having a women's football development plan. This is a prerequisite for them to apply for our programs today. The 10 key principles talk also about equal access for women and girls and giving them ideal playing conditions. Keeping former players involved. This is essential for the development of our sport. They are a golden resource of knowledge and passion for football. Fighting discrimination against women in sport and society is another of the 10 key principles. Following the 10 key principles and the findings of the FIFA survey in 2014, we launched nine development programs specifically dedicated to women's football development that will be implemented between 2015 and 2018. To optimize these programs and to have a greater reach, FIFA doubled the funds for these programs specifically on women's football to 22 million. But I must remind you also that there is a FIFA financial assistance program. 15% of this financial assistance program is also dedicated to women's football. So when we do the math, it will be about $70 million that will be invested on women's football in the next four years. But this is not all. The rest of FIFA women's development programs, general programs, also benefit women's and men's football alike. The programs that we have specifically on women's football focus on very key strategic areas. Grassroots, league development, coaching education, female participation and expertise. We will be implementing over 300 projects only in 2015 in 120 countries. Focusing on female participation as part of this new program and new initiatives, initiatives have been launched. This initiative is fully dedicated to female coaches. We want to help them to continue with further education, to access the best coaching education that they could have, because we need more coaches female coaches to be given the opportunity to train teams around the world. Of course, we would like to see them training female teams, but why not in the future? Also male teams. Unfortunately, at the moment, this is not the case. And we see that we have less female coaches. We are hoping to help them grow and to see more female coaches training more teams around the world. Female participation is linked to success. We confirmed this with our survey in 2014. Top 20 countries in women's football have more female decision makers and have more dedicated staff for women's and girls' football. 90% of the players registered worldwide are also in those top 20 countries. In order to achieve this in a greater number of member associations, we need to work hard and give more opportunities for women to get involved, to be role models for those girls that one day want to join football. We understand that this won't happen overnight and we have to be proactive. As part of FIFA's commitment to have more women participating in football, it was decided to launch a new program which will be focused on developing female leadership. We are hoping, and this is very ambitious, but we would like to develop female football leaders of the future. I would like now to take a little moment to talk to you about Leave Your Goals. This is our campaign to promote women's football, but more importantly, to inspire women and girls around the world to join our sport. Leave Your Goals aim to create the best platforms for women and girls to thrive. The campaign was launched in Germany in 2011 and is today a communication campaign, a development program for member associations, and a platform to communicate and talk about women and girls and to call them to play football. 
We provide support to member associations over a period of four years to implement Leave Your Goals. Today, since we opened applications in 2014, Leave Your Goals is in 50 countries around the world. And we are looking at 35,000 girls participating in festivals and events through Leave Your Goals. But remember, a festival, a grassroots event, is not the end. The girls need to have the right pathway. They should know after a festival where they can find football. Where is the next event? Where is the next club available for them? Please remember this. The job is not done after a festival. We are also using Leave Your Goals as a platform to promote the Women's World Cup and all the qualified teams for the FIFA Women's World Cup in Canada in 2015. Under the scope of Leave Your Goals, we are organizing the FIFA Women's World Cup Canada 2015 Leave Your Goal Tour. So far, we have visited 14 countries. We use the tour stops to interact with member associations, to promote women's football, to interact with the teams, and very important for the future of women's football, to talk and interact with the media. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all those member associations that have welcomed the Leave Your Goal Tour so far, and to acknowledge the media support we have had with this initiative so far. Thank you for all the media coverage given to the Leave Your Goal Tour around the world. Continue to follow us, and I will give you the some of the next dates. Thailand, 11th of March, 2015. Sweden, 15th of March, 2015. Norway, 16th of March, 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of work to be done, and the previous speaker do say so. We have the support of our president, our secretary general, the whole FIFA team, our member associations, confederations. We need the support of everyone. Women lead, lead today from home to business, politics, science. Football is not different. Both on and off the pitch, women can lead. We need to continue working on concrete actions concrete actions to involve women and girls in sport across the globe. It will reflect on society, on health, and it is essential for development. Football can lead the way. Thank you very much for sharing this time with me, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that I'm honored and humbled to be here in the same room as so many amazing women and, and men who have done so much uh, to promote not just football, women's football, but uh, women's rights around the world. So thank you for having me here. I'd like just to take you on a little journey. Um, as uh, she mentioned, I was a professional football player for the last 10 years before I started with uh, FIFA two years ago. I retired uh, with, an, with the women's national team in May 2013, and I ended up in Falfell Wolfsburg in, in Germany. But let's start from the beginning, because as Maji points out, there's a pathway for players like me. Um, I was born in Los Angeles, California. My parents are New Zealanders, as well as my family, and therefore I had both citizenships. Um, I, when I was five years old, I used to run around playing with the boys. And uh, as the president mentioned, I think I thought that football was the most fun sport, probably because I liked the not being in equilibrium. Um, jump forward now to when I'm 18 and I'm, I'm going off to college. I went to Duke University. At Duke University, I got a scholarship. This was also partly due to Title IX in, the, in America, um, which offers the same amount of scholarships for women as it does for men. I was lucky enough to play four years there where I captained the team. After I graduated though, there was really no place for me to go. There was no women's pro league in the US at the time, it had folded, and the only leagues I knew of were really in Europe. However, I didn't have any friends or didn't know anyone that had actually played in Europe, uh, what the teams were like, uh, no idea how many, if they were even professional. Basically, I just got online and, and started Googling, trying to find different teams in, in Europe. I ended up getting two tryouts with uh, two teams in Norway and then as well with FFC Frankfurt in, in Germany. Uh, that was just due to the fact that I got lucky, basically. Uh, I paid my own ticket, flew out to Norway, did two tryouts there, then I flew to Frankfurt and tried out with FFC Frankfurt. 
At that time, Frankfurt was the Euro European champions. I had no idea when I got there. I didn't know who Birgit Prince was. Um, I was playing all of a sudden on the same field with them. Didn't know the language. Didn't realize that the, all the coaches the, only speak German. All the trainings would just be in German. Uh, so I was really a fish out of water, you could say. <laughs> um, at that time in women's football, we didn't really have agents. So I basically was just swimming alone uh, in Germany. Um, after that, I played one season there and I got picked up by a, a club in Sweden called SSK Schleffio, Sunano. So I moved to Sweden and I played three and a half years there. At that club, I think I learned more about myself than I had anywhere um, previously. So I learned German when I was in Germany and when I was in Sweden, I was lucky enough to pick up the language a little bit. Um, in that club though, I've never seen so many people, women, volunteers working to really keep a club alive and to keep, keep the dreams alive that they could stay in the first Dama Svenskan um, league. So that was, that was truly a great experience. From there I went to Australia, that was the um, initial league, the inaugural season for the W League in Australia. I played with Newcastle Jets there for one season, had a wonderful time surfing in the morning and uh, playing in the evenings, traveled all around Australia, uh, really enjoyed that experience. And then from Australia I got lucky enough to be picked up by Falfell Wolfsburg. I think you may know who Falfell Wolfsburg is because they're on the cover of our weekly. If you haven't seen it already, uh, Nila Fisher is on there. They're currently the Champions League um, title holders for the last two years, and I was lucky enough to play with them until 2013 when we won the Frauen Bundesliga, the Pokal Cup, as well as the UEFA Champions League. Um, you could say I'm a little bit lucky that I got this far. I uh, didn't have an agent the entire way. I didn't know any of the languages in any of the countries except for Australia where I played, um, and I kind of was just fighting my own way, finding my own pathway. Um, now I've started with FIFA, and I've been here for two years. And what I find amazing is, is the differences from when I started 10 years ago in women's football until now. 10 years ago, I think probably as well, I wouldn't have actually watched women's football on TV if I'm completely honest. I didn't think the quality was that interesting, and I didn't know any of the players. I think nowadays there's really, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, we all know the players and if we don't then we will le learn them pretty soon in the summer. And um, the quality of the, of the sport has gone up so much. Um, having played with a lot of the players now that are going, you will see this summer, uh, most of them have agents, most of them are professional, they earn enough money to live, which was not the case when I started. And um, I can say that the FIFA Women's World Cup in China and uh, in Germany in 2011, as well as the uh, Olympics in Beijing and in London 2012 were two of the highlights, not only of my career as a sport person, but of my life. Um, being able to, to meet different athletes in the Olympics and being able to play my sport that I loved for so many years in front of so many fans and people who I know shared a passion with me uh, was something truly special for me. Um, Maji mentioned as well the pathway and um, as well as just jobs for women in sports. I think what's really interesting now is a lot of my friends who are now retiring don't really know what to do with their lives. They don't know where to go. There's not a lot of opportunities for women and ex-athletes in sports to go back and to work in sports. So you could say I'm one of the lucky ones, truly lucky, to be working for FIFA and to be working in something that I'm truly passionate about, helping to organize all the Women's World Cups from the under 17 and under 20 to the Women's World Cup this summer. But I think that days like this, conferences like this, and, and people having people like you all around the world who are really promoting not just women in sports, but women athletes, um, as well as men who support women in sports and women athletes, uh, can really create more pathways for players like me so they don't have to get shipped off to Germany not knowing anything and swimming, basically drowning. <laughs> So I thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I thank you for all your efforts that you're doing around the world. I thank you to all the people watching who also are unsung heroes in, in not just women's football, but in women's sports. And I think today is a great, great start. Um, I'm truly looking forward to hearing all of the other speakers today. I think it will be very exciting. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rebecca. Fascinating to hear some of the challenges that you faced over the years and really puts into context where women's football has come from and the direction, hopefully, that it's moving in when Re Rebecca says that um, many of the players in this summer's FIFA Women's World Cup will be able to actually earn a living from the game. When people compare women's and men's football like for like, it just shows that that's an unfair comparison to make. Well, next we're going to hear from H Honey Talgia, who's a very, very important person today. She did not tell me to say that, but she is the brainchild of this conference, the person who's really ensured that this has come to fruition. So it's really her that we have to thank for all this. She's the FIFA Corporate Communications Manager, and also she just happens to be the first ever captain of the Palestine Women's National Team. Not anymore, that was a few years ago, but she really has broken so many barriers in the past, and therefore she is in the perfect position to talk to us about how women's football, and football in general, can break down barriers. Honey. Thank you, Jackie. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great pleasure to be here today, taking part in the first FIFA conference dedicated to women's football and women in leadership. There is no better way to celebrate International Women's Day than by promoting equality in sports and supporting the empowerment of women. As many women around the world today face discrimination and oppression, I would like to take this opportunity to share my experiences about the power of football in changing lives and making a difference. As part of my FIFA duties, I do a lot of public speaking to different audiences all around the world. And it's always funny to watch people guess where I'm from to see them apply their preconceived stereotypes and watch their facial expressions change once they know my true identity. It seems that my identity often confuses people. But I'll make it easier for you. My name is Honey, and Honey is my real name. <laughs> I'm Palestinian, an Arab, Christian, woman from Bethlehem, and I play football. Football is my identity. When I was a little girl playing in the narrow streets of Bethlehem, people called me a tomboy. The neighbors were concerned that nobody will want to marry me in the future. <laughs> and everyone thought that I will grow out of it. But I never grew out of it. There were no girls participating in the game and no places for girls to play football. So I fought to play football with the boys in the streets, like everyone, despite, despite social and the family pressures. Football gave me the determination to go on. Football was an opportunity to challenge society's definitions of gender identity and change social norms. My passion for playing football and my belief in its ability to make a difference helped me overcome all these different challenges. The difficulties of being a young female playing a mainly sport in a conservative, patriarchal environment, of being an Arab Christian woman in a Muslim society. Football gave me the power to bring change. I knew then that I had to develop myself so I could become a positive role model for young girls in our society. That is when we started to establish and develop the Palestinian Women's National Team. It was 2003 in Bethlehem after the Second Intifada. In the midst of destruction, death and despair, football gave us hope. Football empowered me and allowed me to empower other girls and women in my society. Football was an opportunity to take the girls out of their homes and provide them with a platform to positive interactions, social involvement, freedom, and self-esteem. Establishing the Palestinian women's football team was a key determinant in enhancing the role of women in Palestine sport and in society at large, we began to see more and more women in the Palestine Football Association 
and other sports committees, and in the Supreme Council of Youth and Sports. Ten years ago, we started from nothing, with only five female players. Now, we have hundreds of female players playing in 19 football clubs and four national teams, seniors under 19, under 16, and under 14. When we started girls football in one of the small conservative villages in Palestine in 2007, the parents and the community were completely against their daughters playing football. But the community started to realize and appreciate the opportunities that football can present for the girls. The girls 13 years old at that time were excited about being part of the team and their parents wanted to see their daughters play internationally and win and make achievements in sports, bringing pride and honor to their families. Today, two of those girls are part of the Palestinian national women's football team. If women can play football in Palestine, ladies and gentlemen, they can do anything. Football promotes equality. Football changed perception of women to the point where, where the first international game we played in Palestine as a national women's football team attracted tens of thousands of spectators. Men, women, young, old, from the remote villages, a completely packed stadium to support the women's team. It was a great achievement for gender equality through football. Football promotes equality. And football also promotes diversity. In the Palestinian society, sport is mean to bring people together, closer, in a society where Christians and Muslims live together. We were able to foster diversity and national solidarity through sports. If you look at our team today, it's half Christians, half Muslims. But it's one team. We put the plan together. We aim at goals together, we train together, and we laugh and cry together. We are one team. In a context of differences, football creates a culture of unity. When people ask me, how many languages do you speak? I say three. English, Arabic, and football. E un poco español. Football is an international language that people speak and understand. Regardless of all our differences, at the end, we are all together. Football knows no borders. In Palestine, football is also a platform and a voice to communicate a different story to the rest of the world. A story not about death and misery. A story about endurance, teamwork, enjoyment a celebration of life. Football is for everybody, regardless of class, gender, or nationality. The popularity and beauty of the game brings together millions of displaced Palestinians from all around the world to share their identity by taking pride in Palestinian football experiences. In the absence of statehood and recognition, football brought a reason for celebration. Football gives identity. As a Palestinian Christian Arab young woman, the challenges are endless, especially when football was always my dream. But no matter what the circumstances were, as soon as I set foot on the pitch, it didn't matter anymore whether I'm a boy or a girl, Christian or Muslim, poor or rich or even oppressed. In the end, football makes us all equal. Football liberates the mind. In context of social, political, and economic restrictions, football gives freedom. And now, I'm able to spread this message of hope through my work with FIFA and by supporting FIFA's projects globally. 
Through FIFA's programs with member associations across the world, we provide spaces for all people from all corners of the planet to unite in celebration of football free from politics and prejudice. Although there is more work to be done, these programs are already having a real positive impact on people's lives. As a Palestinian Arab woman, football gave me the confidence to realize that the sky is the limit, not the walls. The little girl who started playing in the narrow streets of Bethlehem became a co-founder of Palestinian national women's football team, then the first ever captain to captain this team, and then the first woman in the Middle East to get a FIFA master's degree and work at FIFA. Football empowered me to reach for the stars. And it's my hope that we can all work together to change the lives of millions of girls and women around the world through football. Thank you, and I wish you all a constructive day. Okay, now the fun starts. This is the start of the first panel. Uh, this morning panel will be about women's football, and as we mentioned earlier, this afternoon will be a panel debating women in leadership, primarily in football, of course, but beyond those barriers as well. So, if we could please welcome to the stage our panelists. Got some fantastic ones as well. Moya Dodd. Thank you, Moya. Sandra Gage. Kelly Simmons, Arno Simon, and Ishii Johansson. Well, that's quite a welcome. <laughs> Hi, Anna. I'm going to introduce all our panellists to you, and then they're all going to say a few words each on their perspective of uh, women's football in the world today and the issues that they'd like to address in particular. And then uh, do have some thoughts yourself as to questions you'd like to ask. There'll be plenty of time for those in due course, and we'll also be taking them from people uh, on Twitter, people watching via our YouTube channel, and on FIFA.com. So it's very much an inclusive debate. We'll hear from the experts first of all, but we'd like to hear everybody else's perspectives as well. So first of all, if we could hear from Moya Dodd who is a FIFA Executive Committee member, Vice President of the Asian Football uh, Confederation, member of Football Federation Australia, Board Chair of the FIFA Task Force for Women's Football. Anything else? I mean, goodness gracious, what else do you do in your spare time? Former Australia player, of course. Oh, and she's a lawyer, by the way, because she's got so much free time. And uh, she was also named one of World Soccer Magazine's People of the Year in 2013. Moya. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you for having me today. Uh, can you hear me? Do I need to speak? into any of these devices? Or they should it? pick you up, okay. okay. If you can't hear anybody, then do let okay. us know. We do have spare microphones as well, in addition. So if you'd like to speak up, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Uh, terrific to be here today. Terrific to see so many faces here in the room and know that there are so many around the world uh, being part of this gathering and part of this debate. Uh, I think uh, today we've got an opportunity to uh, create a turning point, to create a watershed moment in football in the world and uh, really turn it into something that is inclusive, that is embracing of uh, all of the people in the world, especially that, that half that hasn't really had a fair go at the game so far. Uh, I'm uh, lucky to be the chair of the task force that worked on the 10 principles. Um, and when I look at those 10 principles, I see those as the, uh, the things that we thought would be the key enablers, the key accelerators of uh, women's football and women's involvement in football uh, throughout the world. Uh, I also see that uh, we, we, did a, we had a survey uh, done by FIFA and CIES that was released last week and that tells you how we stack up actually right now against the ambitions that we've set out in those 10 key principles. It shows you that there's a lag, it shows you that we've got a long way to go. Um, and you know, to me, uh, the opportunity to help close that gap through the actions that we take as FIFA and that uh, all of those in the pyramid of football take. That is, for me, the key, uh, answers the key challenge uh, of our time. 
more broadly in the world, which is to enable women to participate more fully in society. I mean, we still live in a world where uh, women are systemically disadvantaged uh, throughout the world, where girls pretty much from birth or even before birth uh, are disadvantaged uh, in the world that they arrive into. And sport is one of the things that can uh, powerfully alter the, uh, the world that those, those girls face relative to their brothers. And uh, I think you know, this, is, this is one of the key challenges of our time. A hundred years ago, hardly any women could, could vote even. Uh, now, women you see appearing, Lydia talked about heads of government, heads of state, they're appearing at the tops of corporations in senior roles, uh, in, in functions throughout society and throughout sport. Um, this, I think, is the key challenge of our time, to harness uh, the best of humanity for the cause that will make our society a better place. And I think football occupies a very privileged position in society. It's the game that uh, the world plays the most, watches the most, loves the most. I mean, it's the world's best game, by a long way, I think. And that, put, that means that we have uh, a unique position in, uh, in demonstrating and enabling change uh, throughout the world for the betterment of us all. So that is the challenge that we're here to answer today, I think. Okay, thanks, Moya. Uh, to another woman who's uh, very senior in the world of football, Isha Johansson. Introductions in no particular order, by the way, but a senior woman in, in football, president of the Sierra Leone Football Association, the first female FA president in Sierra Leone and the second in the world, a humanitarian entrepreneur as well with success in a, a youth football project, which was uh, arisen after the, the brutal war in Sierra Leone almost two decades ago. Um, and Isha says, when women win... We all succeed. What did you mean by that? Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I think that um, wh whenever we mention uh, Sierra Leone, or Sierra Leone is mentioned, it's, it's always to do with crisis. If it isn't the civil war, it's recently now with Ebola. Um, having said that, uh, it's, it's a country that uh, is one of the most beautiful. It has a lot of resources. Um, uh, football is manical football, and I don't say this loosely, is a second religion in our country. Um, when I say when women win, we all succeed. Taking into consideration our setting, our cultural setting, uh, the women are the real um, uh, house makers, if you like. They're the real income earners. The, the women are the workers. They're the traders. They're out there farming. Um, they're out there picking up the pieces after the war. The women were the most vulnerable, the children were, but they were the ones that picked up the pieces again and built the homes. The, the husbands had been killed. Um, and when a woman is successful in our setting, she's the one that will bring the money home. She's the one that will look after the child. She's the one who sets the pace. So, you know, when one woman wins, the, the family wins, the nation wins, if you like. So it was in that context that, that I used that. And, and I go along with that all the time. Okay. I'm staying with a senior woman in football, Kelly Simmons, FA Director of the National Game and Women's Football. You oversee children's, grassroots, and semi-pro football at the Football Association. And you're responsible for the Game Changer Strategy, which is the FA's master plan for women's football. Uh, yes, um, good morning everyone. It's fantastic to be here. Um, so one of my roles, as Jackie said, is to oversee Game Changer. That's our plan for the women's game. It kind of breaks down in, into three priority areas for us. Um, one is to develop our Women's Super League. We created a quite new elite league playing across the summer. Uh, been quite innovative um, in the way we set that out. Uh, we want to develop professional women's football. I'm sure we'll talk about that as part of the panel and the challenges around that. Um, to do that, we've split out our commercial and broadcast rights and selling them separately and trying to bring new partners on board that will help us deliver our ambitions in the women's game. Uh, second key part of the plan is to develop better young players, develop better coaches and support staff to ultimately make uh, England successful and all of the benefits that will deliver right across the women's game in England. And then thirdly, to, to grow participation, we've already seen, despite the huge growth um, in the game globally, the gap in participation levels between men and women, and, and in England that's no different. Uh, currently over a million women and girls play football in England, but we've still got a huge amount to do, and we've started uh, quite a new project with the Premier League and the Football League um, to utilise the power of their brands and the infrastructure they've got in those big professional clubs in England to bring 
engage more women uh, and girls to play the sport. And in nine months, we've seen 20,000 uh, additional uh, girls and young women starting to play through those clubs. So I think you know, the role of men's football clubs is hugely important, certainly in England and I know in a number of countries, uh, in terms of the development of the game. And, you know, we all face, I appreciate, we all face hugely different challenges in our, our leadership roles trying to drive the women's game forward across the world. I've sort of picked out a couple um, that are sort of particularly pertinent to me, but, um, you know, there's a number that we'll talk about today. I think, first of all, we've got to increase the number of women in leadership positions um, in federations, and it just makes sense to do so. You know, it will help, you know, if we've got better balance and a better range of perspectives on our football federation boards, then we will bring in more female players, more female referees, more coaches, more new revenue streams um, by opening up you know, the 50% of the market that's been excluded for so long. So I think it's really important that we get more women in those key leadership roles. And I think FIFA should be applauded for what they've done by working out a way through elections and co-options to get three women onto the FIFA Executive Committee. And I think as part of International Women's Day or the weekend uh, around that, you know, it'd be great if football federations across the world could reflect on whether they are genuinely doing enough to get those women in key leadership roles and empowering women to come through um, to take up those key roles that are going to help close the gap um, across the world. And then the second area really is the commercial development of the game. And I think if we're going to take women's football onto the next level globally, then cracking professional women's football you know, is a big challenge for all of us. I know a number of us in this room are grappling with that. Um, it is a big challenge. Uh, I know this afternoon we've got Ruth, who's the Chief Exec of Women in Sport. She'll talk about in England that I think it's 0.5% of commercial sports revenues goes to women's sport. I think they get 7% of media coverage. And in that environment, trying to be the breakthrough sport um, that becomes a professional women's sport is hugely challenging. And I'm, and that I'm sure those percentages, whilst they might shift a little bit up and down as you go across the world, they're probably pretty similar uh, in terms of trying to, to crack commercial revenues, uh, broadcast revenues and, and space in the media for women's football. If we can do that, then we will, you know, that will have, it will continue to improve the product massively. You know, it will take women's football to even bigger audiences and it will inspire more girls to play. So it will have a knock-on effect, I think. So there's a couple of things, but, you know, everybody's got different challenges. Well, thank you, Kelly. That's a perfect link to Arno Simon, uh, who is the director of TV content for the Eurosport Group. You started your TV career 23 years ago, and you say that women's sport is the new frontier. So how do you address these challenges that Kelly mentioned in terms of um, bringing women's football to a wider audience? Is the intent there? Is, is amongst broadcasters, do you feel, to really get women's football out there? Do you feel the demand is there already, or is it something you have to create? Yeah, I think both. I, I think we are in, um, we have both positions on that. First of all, we think that uh, um, women's sport development is inexorable. Uh, you know, more and more women are practicing sports. I think more than half of the people practicing sports on a daily basis are women. Uh, women would be more and more involved in uh, leading from the small clubs to the top leagues and federations. That would take time. That will happen. One day, the FIFA president will be a woman. I don't know when, but one day it will happen also. That's, that's for sure. And women are more and more consuming sports. Uh, so we have a kind of really pragmatic and I would say, I dare to say it, business approach, saying as a sports channel, uh, in our ecosystem, how could we forget half of the humanity? We have a fantastic new market beyond us, in front of us. Um, why only men can decide to subscribe to a pay sport TV content? I think in the near future, and it's starting already, women will already, you know, in households, decide that, yeah, I would like to watch some women football, I would like to watch tennis, and I'm, I'm ready to, to pay for sport TV content. So for us also, it's a fantastic new market, and uh, as Eurosport, uh, we, w we want to be trendsetters on that. We want to be re really pioneers, and we have the feeling that it's very important to be part of this trend. So you have this woman's uh, very strong development in sport in general, and then you have football, and that, as we said this morning, football is really the king of sports. If you mix the two, the combination is just a killer application. And for Eurosport, Football, woman football, first of all, 
its potential and promising ratings. Secondly, uh, it's, as I said, uh, increase our, I would say, subscription attractiveness. Uh, we want also women football to be um, a new potential for ad sales and for brands. It's still, it's still a little bit shy, to be honest. Uh, a lot of brands are saying, I love women football, this is fantastic, but, but they don't really, for the moment, implement strong campaigns on media to support it. So this is something that we, we need to consider also. And of course, for Eurosport, it's a very identifying and, and strong positioning uh, you know, to, um, to be able to support and develop women's sport. So this is conviction, commitment, engagement, but also a very pragmatic and, and, and I would say business-oriented uh, approach. Mm, okay, plenty to come on to in a little bit when we talk about the, the marketing and the branding side of things. I just want to introduce Sandra first, talking to you, talking marketing, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for NOC Canada. She's been involved in marketing and communication for over 20 years in the sporting arena. She's also generated over $100,000 in revenues through key leadership roles in figure skating and basketball. So what's your perspective on where we are with women's football at the moment? Well, I think, um, first of all, I want to say thank you to FIFA for having me here today, because I think as my FIFA colleagues um, have said, it's a very humbling experience to sit here, to be honest, because I feel like I go to work every day and it's not work. And I've worked a number of years in sports, as you mentioned, and I look at sport not only in my professional role, but in my personal life, because I'm a soccer mom at the end of the day. I'm driving my kids to practice learn so much about the sport because I didn't grow up with the sport. So um, I've worked in other sports and, um, and learned those lessons and, and I think not only across sports but across the level of sports. So at the community level the lessons that we learn at a very early age can carry through to this stage today and those lessons are so critical. So I think in women's football it's about talking about what's happening at the grassroots as much as what's happening at the high performance level and I think in Canada we're very proud to be an early adopter of the women's game. And so it's the perfect storm for the largest Women's World Cup to be coming to Canada. We're very, very privileged, we're very honoured, and we feel very responsible. And as a woman on the senior leadership team, I feel especially responsible to make sure that it is a success. So I think there's a lot to learn, and, and, um, and I think being an early adopter, you're taking some risks. But it's, an, it's, it's about taking risk and making investments, and the investments, and, and I think to what Arno's talking about, I think the investments actually at our level, the investments that people want to make are as much about the grassroots as they are about the high performance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important piece for us to talk about today because um, everybody wants to be a part of the big show and the high performance in the World Cup. That's, that's a no-brainer. Um, I've often told our women's team after they won the bronze medal at the Olympic Games, they made my job pretty easy. And I had the best job in Canada, sport marketing-wise, because it's, it's um, lightning in a bottle at the end of the day. They were water cooler talk, they're relevant, and when you're relevant, people want to invest. We have a saying that uh, you play at home, you win at home, and you put it on TV. And that's going to make you relevant, and then that's going to grow, and there's going to be revenues coming in because of that, and then you can reinvest those revenues, and it's a cycle. It's, it really is a cycle. So um, the survey, actually, uh, the football survey that was just released, one of the elements that I think was highlighted was the fact that um, the investment is wanted um, at the high performance level. And I actually think that's a bit of a, I'm not saying it's a miss, don't get me wrong, it's not a critical comment. I just think that there's so much opportunity at the grassroots level. Because I think with my um, Canada soccer hat on actually, because I'm in a seconded role from our federation, people want to invest in our grassroots as much as they do our high performance. Because we have so many young players across the country uh, participating in the sport. Things like the World Cup give us an opportunity to grow those numbers. Um, one of the legacy uh, pieces that we love to talk about is, and this is something that actually FIFA Development has helped us fund, is our physical health education program. We have over 900,000 students across the country right now exposed to the sport of soccer that may not have been before. That's more than our registered numbers. Of, of players right now and that's because of the World Cup so what we've done is taken something that's a high performance piece and we've actually brought it to the grassroots and we just continue to, to I think broaden the appeal of the sport make it more relevant expose it to more people and hopefully you know all of us will benefit from that so it sounds as though Canada has already embraced this Women's World Cup I mean what percentage mm -hmm. of the people there would you say are fully aware it's happening and are seeing 
uh, seeing marketing around it every single day, and how many of them do you think will be a lot more aware nearer the time as is fairly common when these events actually spring to life sure um, well we did research a, a couple years ago I've actually been part of the World Cup from the bid process so it's been near and dear to my heart for for a few years now and when we started we did some research and nine in ten Canadians were aware of the FIFA Women's World Cup whether or not it was happening in Canada they weren't at that point but 90% of our country knew about the FIFA Women's World Cup so you know, when our women won that bronze medal in London, the first thing that they were speaking about when they were interviewed was, we can't wait for 2015. We can't wait for 2015. So, as I said, lightning in a bottle, right? It's, it's a pretty uh, good position to be in as a marketer when, when your ambassadors are speaking in those terms. So, so we know that's the case. Um, I would say now is really we're less than 100 days away. And uh, without a doubt, um, it, is, it is really the talk of the country. And, and people are excited. And we're in six cities across Canada, as I think President Blatter referenced, second largest landmass in the world. And uh, we're from coast to coast, so we have five time zones we're dealing with. So our biggest challenge when we talk about challenges is making sure we have a great event across all six cities with consistency and fair play across those cities, but that each Canadian uh, city that's involved in this has their opportunity to show their unique character. And that's really what we're trying to make sure um, continues through the next less than 100 days, 92 to be exact. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you mentioned your semi-final uh, or your gold, your silver, sorry, bronze medal, excuse me, at the uh, <laughs> the London Olympics. Who remembers the semi-final against the United States at Old Trafford in Manchester? <laughs> it was one. It, in fact, I've written an article for Glamour magazine for next month saying it was the best football match, male or female, I've ever ever been to. It was a few nods of approval of that. It was phenomenal. I'm, I'm sure you still feel that you were robbed on the day, but we won't go into the refereeing decisions at the you know moment. What? It's all okay. That's because... probably for another day, but uh, yeah. absolutely fascinating and uh, look forward to hopefully some more matches like that at the FIFA Women's World Cup in the summer. Now, I thought a good place to start our panel debate as such would be the 10 key principles of FIFA, which Moya Dodd here had a large input into implementing. And that's, that's quite a recent implementation as well. It's not so much statutes which are in place at the moment, but what you really feel needs to happen for women's football to grow and to ultimately be a great success. Now, forgive me for paraphrasing slightly some of them that you've put together, but they really are right at the core of, of what we need to discuss today. You said along the lines of football should ideally be equally as accessible to girls in FIFA member nations, including schools, etc. Now, I'm sure plenty of us speak from personal experience that when we were at school, women's football was not accessible at all, full stop. When we were asked if we could play, no, you can play hockey, tennis, netball, what have you. Where are we now in terms of where you would like to be of giving girls equal opportunities right from school level? Um, well, look, I think we've made enormous progress uh, since I was at school and you, and you were at school, which is probably a little later than when I was at school. but. Uh, you know, we still have an enormous distance to go. Um, and I, I think for so long, football was considered a game for boys and men. That was their game and we did something else. We did ballet or netball or something. And uh, that was just how things were. So to challenge that and to uh, get to the world where actually it's just as normal for a, a girl to play as it is for a boy to play, that's quite a lot of, that's quite a distance to travel and around the world across many cultures and in many contexts. Um, and sometimes the, the, the gap is very clear and very explicit. I mean, there's countries where women are not, women or girls are not permitted to play at all. It's just not allowed. Um, to, to other situations which are much more subtle. Um, I mean, I have a daughter, she's, she's eight. And, uh, you know, she, she plays, she loves to play football, but she comes home all the time with stories about something that happened and you know there, there are much less uh, obvious barriers that she faces. For example, she comes home from a, a school holiday program that she's been to with her brother and, uh, and she says, well she came home a bit upset one day and I said, what, what's the matter? And she said, well, you know, today I wore my Liverpool clothes and nobody said, yay Liverpool to me. And I said, really? What do, you, what do you mean? And she said, well yesterday he, it's her brother, he wore his Liverpool clothes and everybody said yay Liverpool to him. All the coaches talk to him about Liverpool, but today, so today I wore my Liverpool clothes, and you know, 
young girls are very observant. Today I wore my Liverpool clothes and she was expecting that she would get all this attention from the coaches who <laughs> would talk about Stevie G or the latest result and nobody did. And she came, she came home disappointed. So why was that? Well, I guess, I guess it's because when people see a little boy in a Liverpool outfit, they assume that he knows all about the team. When they see a little girl in a Liverpool outfit, they don't make the same assumption. They think she's wearing his hand-me-downs or maybe that somebody's dressed her up or something like that. But they don't assume, well, she knows all about the team. So that's, that's a much more subtle thing than not being allowed to play at all. Uh, she came home a few weeks ago and said that they played, she was in a mixed, uh, a mixed game, and every time she scored a goal, because it was a shooting game, so every time she scored a goal, the goalkeeper got teased by the other boys because he'd let in a goal against a girl. Now, that kind of puts him down, but it puts her down as well. So, you know, these sort of things are very, they're, they're, they're very subtle, but they absolutely exist throughout football. And, uh, you know, I think to get to the point where it is truly accessible, for girls to play, where they are just as welcome as boys. They're made to feel at home. It's, it's normal for them to play. They don't stand out as being, oh my God, that, you know, she scored a goal, therefore there's something different about that goal and, 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 the, and the goalkeeper has to be teased about it. To get beyond that to a world where it's utterly normalised for a girl to participate, uh, we've still got a way to go. We've still got a lot of self-reflection and self-examination as a sport to ask ourselves whether, you know, if every boy brought their sister would there be a place for her to play? Would she be as welcome to play? Um, what would we do with all these girls? How would we make them at home? It, it, you know, imagine if you had, and once we did, have schools that were just for boys. Once upon a time, only boys went to school. Then we had girls being involved in education. So what did that mean for the education system? Well, you had to have girls' toilets. Uh, you started to have female teachers. You maybe you changed the curriculum. Uh, and you made it more uh, uh, flexible and more appropriate for children of both genders to learn. Um, maybe you changed the way classrooms were set up. You might have changed a lot of things about that education system once girls began to participate. Um, and I think that process is underway in football and it's an ongoing one. It's a work in progress. But you said that in some nations, girls and women still aren't allowed to play football. And how many of the member nations is that? Uh, well, if you look on the FIFA rankings, you'll see that it goes down to number 133. And there's 209 member federations in FIFA. So that tells you that there are some who aren't appearing at all at senior national team level. Um, and, you know, often... Um, women's football, I think, is played everywhere. It is played in Saudi Arabia, for example. There is a woman who organises a club and it's all played pretty much behind closed doors in private clubs because uh, there is no legitimate endorsed way for women to play football in that country. Um, so I think it's played everywhere, but whether it's played with legitimacy in organised competitions, with uh, a welcome mat for new players and a pathway to the FIFA World Cup is an entirely uh, different question. So a long way to go. I think a long way to go. But how do FIFA encourage those associations to encourage women and girls to be allowed to play football? Is there any sanctions even that could be put in place for those who don't allow it? Uh, well, uh, the development programs FIFA runs um, come with some uh, incentives and conditions, I guess you could say. And one of them reflects the first principle, uh, which is that uh, women's football is an enormous growth opportunity for every member federation. And so every member federation should have a plan to develop it. I think without a plan, you just have a series of kind of random actions which may or may not lead you to where you want to go. I mean, if you want to get fit, right? You, you get yourself a fitness program. You don't just wake up on Monday and think, I'll go for a run, and then on Tuesday you think, well, you know, I'll, I might eat fruit today and that'll be healthy. And You know, you have a plan and you do it. So FIFA asks that when, uh, uh, when members apply for the development grants that they uh, produce a plan. So uh, I think 120 countries applied for development programs this cycle. So that's 120 plans that are there. Now, whether those plans are highly developed, whether they're perfect, is really not the main question. The point is somebody has sat down and thought about it and hopefully bought into it. And plans are valuable because they guide action. So that kind of action is what we hope will translate into accessibility for girls and women. Uh, other development programs are specifically designed for accessibility, like the Live Your Goals festivals that you see. That's an entry-level activity that any member federation can, uh, can roll out and, and basically roll out the welcome mat for you know, 100 to 300 girls to come along and, and play on the day. 
Forgive me for being cynical, but anybody can You're write a You're a book. journalist. You're a <laughs> I'm a journalist. Actually, it's sorry. expected. Come I on. I can't even apologise for it. Be cynical. I'm sorry, I can't apologise. Um, anybody can write a plan. Mm -hmm. Anyone can say, if you give me lots of money, here's my plan for how I'm going to say, yes, women and girls can play football in my member nation. Thank you very much for my money. And here's my plan. You can read that and I'll go away and spend my money on men's football. Is there any comeback? Uh, there are uh, the grant system that FIFA has in place requires some of those grants to be spent on women's football. Um, and again, proof of that. The, they the have cynic, to actually that, do that's, it. that's auditable and it is audited. Mm. Um, again, a cynic would say, "Well, you know, is it really? Was it the be look?" At the end of the day, you need to persuade the decision makers and those who hold the reins of power in every member federation that it's important to do it, because then you no longer need to regulate particular outcomes or, 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 or particular uh, spends of money. Um, and you know, that is, I think, the, when you zoom out, that's kind of the bigger task that we all face, is to persuade those who run football throughout the pyramid of the game, not just member federations, but in media organisations, in, uh, within sponsors, uh, within the coaching fraternity and the, and the, the technical uh, uh, people who are overwhelmingly male, to persuade those uh, constituencies that it is um, meaningful, it is significant, it is important and it is to your benefit to be fully inclusive of women and girls in the game of football. That is the bigger task that I think we all undertake every day. Um, but yes, there are specific measures that are implemented to, um, to reward or to uh, uh, disincent uh, certain kinds of uh, behaviours in resourcing and in priority. You sure where do we stand with the uh, development of women's football in Africa? Nice, easy, massively broad question for you there, but, but and there are lots of, uh, lots of different member nations, of course, in Africa, but from your experience I, and I think, talking to other yes. presidents. I think Africa's doing quite well, considering um, in terms of uh, women football development, especially when we look at Ghana and we look at um, Nigeria as well, their participation. And I know that we take a lot of um, uh, incentives, if you like, uh, uh, from them. Because again, talking about Sierra Leone, whenever we start, something happens and it brings us to a grinding halt. Um, it's interesting what you were talking earlier about um, um, women's football uh, 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 being part of the society and having to develop that more. In Sierra Leone, the women, um, don't really play football and we're trying to encourage them. We had a, a FIFA, there is a FIFA documentary that hopefully at some time will be shown where they went to Sierra Leone to feature our national team. We have one which isn't really a national team. These girls are what, between the ages of 16 to 20, so it's our under 20 that we put up as the national team. The captain was actually captured uh, by the rebels and she learned how to play football in the jungle with the rebels. But uh, of course she was rescued by uh, the British military when they came out of there. We are trying, and, and these are the girls who play football and these are the girls who are the uh, icons that, that are using sports and football in particular to, to rise above the insecurities, the stigma of being raped during war, the stigma of having lost a family. They're the ones who represent football and hope for women. What we are trying to do is um, to get into the schools hopefully after the Ebola uh, sanctions are off, we'll start with the Ministry of Education and have it as part of the syllabus. Because like, like you, myself, we didn't have football. I didn't play football at school. I played with my brothers. I was the typical tomboy, like you, honey. Okay, we, we didn't have that opportunity to do that. We want to start going back into the schools, have it as a the syllabus for physical education, play football as an option to netball, volleyball, what have you that we have now in Sierra Leone. Uh, Africa, coming back to your point, I think um, they have um, a lot more FIFA input because they're developing and they're going places. Um, we have a situation where hopefully in September we will start the first female national youth league again with the support of FIFA. We're hoping to see where that takes us. But again, I think we, what we're going to have to do is to come back into the schools, start tapping them from 11 and work our way. Uh, we've got a way, way long, but I am very proud of countries like Nigeria and Ghana, uh, their full participation, and they do well uh, in, in these competitions. You mentioned Nigeria. Um, 
the only positive that I can think of uh, from an English point of view of the slower development of, of Nigerian women's football is that Eni Aluko, who is now a superstar of England women's football, said that she couldn't actually choose to play for her nation of birth, Nigeria, because there wasn't a women's football team at the time. Her brother does play for them, um, but that just shows how, uh, how, how much behind um, they are. But good to hear that that progress is being made from a... Yes. A different, more European point of view, Kelly, where do things stand in terms of the development of, of women's football in England? Bearing in mind that it's such a massive, massive sport for the men's game as it is throughout the rest of Europe, how much does that actually hamper the women's game and how much does that help in terms of everybody loves football already? Yeah, yeah there's definitely some, some pros and cons. Um, obviously, these are pretty much... Like I think someone said earlier, it's, it's a religion in England. Every, you know, nearly everybody is a football fan, has got an opinion on the game, watches it every night on television, um, and and that means that you know you've got young girls that that want to play, fall in love with the sport anyway, and, and want to play. So um, so if, you know, you're not selling the game of, of football in a sense. You're just trying to break down some of those cultural barriers um, that have been there for years, which we have chipped and chipped away at, which is that girls will play these girls' sports and boys will play football, rugby, cricket. And it's been very, you know, based on your gender, you're very much channeled down those routes. And, and for ages, I've sort of, you know, argued that um, PE in schools, you know, it's the only subject where you're allowed to differentiate your offer between boys and girls. So when I was growing up, you know, girls were channeled to do cookery. Um, and, and boys did, you know, metal work. And, and that would be an absolute outrage now. But yet, you've still got, despite the fact that we've chipped away massively and now a, a lot of girls play football in schools, but you've still got schools that will, will decide, based on preferences of a PE teachers, what sports they're going to offer, and they can be different for boys and girls. And I think that, personally, that is unacceptable. I think that if boys are offered football, girls should be offered football. And we've done an awful lot to shift that. But there is still a gap um, in terms of the amount of um, football for boys in schools as there are for girls. So still more work to do, I think, in challenging those, those cultural barriers. Um, the profile at the top end of the women's game is helping to shift those perceptions about football being a sport for women and girls, the success of the Women's Super League, um, having BBC, plug, plug, Baby. Jackie, BBC <laughs> uh, and BT Sport as our broadcast partners. Um, getting much wider reach in terms of women's football is helping to, to, to challenge those old stereotypes, I guess, and get more and more girls uh, and women into the game. Seeing as Kelly was so desperate to plug the BBC there, I'm just going to help her out by um, putting a bit of flesh on the bone that uh, every single match of the FIFA Women's World Cup will be available to view on the BBC this summer, which is huge progress, bearing in mind that when Hope Powell here took England to the 2009 uh, Euro final. Uh, it was only the final that was shown. Now I'm going to get told off my, by my bosses for mentioning that, but that well, is. Um, but well, that I was is lobbying behind the scenes using MPs to lobby the BBC, so I'll probably get sacked as well. So we'll go together. Today. Let's all get sacked. Brilliant. To, to try and get the BBC to cover the uh, the quarters. I think when we we come into it, that's yeah, that's how much it's moved on. Okay. Yeah. yeah and talking of of broadcasting, so we've got you here. I know you touched on it earlier about. Um, about the progress that's being made in terms of women's football being attractive to, to broadcast, because you don't have to show any women's football, you're a commercial entity. No. Um, you can show whatever you like, frankly, but you have led the way for many years in showing many women's football tournaments at, at youth level as well. So just explain to us how it works behind the scenes in the decision-making pro process as to which tournaments you show and why, and of course the commercial side of that as well. We, you know, even internally, you know, uh, there is a debate. Uh, everything is not easy, even in Eurosport. You, disc you, you know, we are broadcasting in 54 countries around Europe. Uh, so, as you know, the norther you go, the easier is it, is it, it is to convince about women football. The thouser, the more difficult. Um, and what we're trying to do is to, to show women's football in every dimension. Um, we have this partnership with FIFA and with UEFA, with the best competition like the World Cup in June, but also under 17, under 20. Uh, we are also um, showing clubs competition, uh, Champions League, and uh, two main uh, national leagues, uh, Germany and France, 
on a, on a regular and weekly basis. This is also something very important. We need to have these very strong moments, these peaks, you know, these highlights that, that what we're going to have in Canada in, um, in June. But it is very important for women's football to be in the radar on a regular basis, week after week. And for that, national leagues are crucial. You know, uh, we, this is something, and I've heard that this morning, and, and I'm glad to hear it. This is very important that in every single country in Europe, and not only in Europe, we can have on a regular basis games that are seen on, shown on, t on television about national leagues, uh, because this is where we're going to create the habit and the fact that there will be a conception, a recurrency, a consistency in the women football development. So in a way, we are trying to show women's football. We try to do that in every dimension, national teams, clubs. Uh, we even launched in France uh, uh, the first weekly uh, talk show, 100% dedicated to women football, uh, on some Monday night. In this talk show, we talk about women football like we would talk about male football, you know. So uh, that can be some polemical dimensions, uh, analysis, uh, uh, deep dive, uh, deep diving into some games. Um, and it's pretty much appreciated in France. It created a lot of buzz. Uh, it's doing very well in terms of ratings. Because, you know, um, people are expecting that you talk about female football like you would talk about male football. On Eurosport, 80% of the people watching women football are men, which is very important. This is the proof that we are here uh, on a discipline, on a sport that, is, that can satisfy you know, the male's fan. And this is a strong sign that we are not here in a kind of fashion or trend or something like that. Uh, it will progress and, and improve uh, very strongly in the near future. Because, because you know, male and, and men, they like male football and they're watching also women football. So, you know, we, we try to, be, to do that in every dimension, as I, as I told you. For us, it is an investment on, on the future. It's like a club, you know, so you can buy some very fa some fantastic players, but you have also to, have to create your own talents uh, of tomorrow. And this, it's part of our DNA at Eurosport to always look at what will be strong in the future. And women football, for sure, is, uh, is, is part of that. And so you're clearly hoping that sponsors will look at that and say, We've got a, a women's football brand here, which is ever increasing in popularity. Therefore, the sponsors are thinking, we want to be part of that. What sort of sponsors do you think are attracted to women's football television programmes <laughs> and matches? For the, for the moment, it's, 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 not a huge, it's not a huge phenomenon, to be honest. Uh, brands are, are still a little bit reluctant to invest specifically on the media, uh, on, on women's football. Why is They're, that? I don't know, because they have a kind of global, sometimes global partnership or global package with, with men and women football, but they will mainly concentrate it on, on, on you know, men's activation. Uh, and there will be on, on women's football, a little bit by coincidence, they like it. But it's, it's maybe something is going on here, but it's not very, there's not huge investment, this is not massive. Uh, we have some discussion with big brands saying, wow, I like women's football values, you know, the references, authenticity, freshness, accessibility of the players. Um, but it's still not very massive. I hope, it, but it will come. It's, you know, this is why there's a long way to go for every one of us here. It's, um, it's a long process. It, things are going very fast, not as fast as we would like to, but things are going very fast. And time will come when, you know, brands will fight to, uh, to billboard the, 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 this uh, Femme de Foot talk show in France, or the, uh, the Bundesliga, the Women Bundesliga League. You know, Germany is a very strong country for, for, for women football, but German Bundesliga was not broadcasted in Germany on a regular basis. I was very surprised to see that. So that's why with Eurosport we started to do it. So, you know, it's, it's really a, a long way to go, but I, I, 100% confident that uh, that would be a very big success story. Yeah, when we throw this open to the floor, by the way, it'd be really interesting to get any other viewpoints from other nations around Europe, around the world, about the marketing and the broadcast side of things in terms of women's football. So please do formulate some questions along those lines. Uh, Sandra, 
from your point of view, the marketing of women's football in Canada, you mentioned it was, it was along the lines of pushing it an open door, bearing in mind some of the recent success of the Canada national side. How do you view it from a marketing point of view as a whole? Well, I think it goes back to relevancy. And I think what Arno's talking about, I think as soon as corporate partners see the relevancy of the game, and it doesn't have to be a women's game or a men's game. I don't think the comparison, we talk about the sport being gender neutral in Canada. To be honest, our president regularly does that because this Women's World Cup is as much about the sport in our country as it is about the women's sport coming. We actually have the women's sport leading the way for us in Canada. And that's very unusual, I know, across the world. And we're very proud of that because I think mainly our women's team has had much more success than the men's team has. So from a TV viewership point of view, one in three Canadians watch that semi-final game. Over 10 million people watch that semi-final game. So that's why nine of 10 Canadians knew about the FIFA Women's World Cup. That's the reality check. But when we did the research further to talk about who those players were they might know, very few knew anybody beyond Christine, Marta, Abby, Hope, that was probably the extent of it. So what do you do? You need to tell the story. And I think FIFA is doing a fabulous job of helping us to do that for this tournament. So that's the number one objective that we have is to educate not only Canadians but the rest of the world about this sport and the beautiful uh, game as being played in a way that it's not a men's game or women's game, it's the way the game should be played. And so we're, we really focus on, on the fact that this is the, this is the game to watch, this is where you want to be, and, and we think that that's really important because that's the relevancy factor and that's what people attach to. And that goes back to your comments about your daughter. It's, it's teaching that at the community level, that it's not, you know, I, I grew up with, I remember my father clearly saying to me, you don't throw, you don't skate like a girl, you skate like a boy and you don't throw the ball. Because I grew up playing a lot of sports and he didn't mean it any it's other a way. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, he had a son, he had daughters. We all played sports. He didn't mean it that way. Um, and I remember him watching the women's game and saying, I just so much more enjoy watching women's soccer than men's soccer because it's the way the game should be played. And I think that's full circle in life when he said that to me. So, um, and I think, you know, with I have a son and a daughter and I, I don't make those comparisons because I didn't appreciate it when I was that age. So we have responsibilities in our personal and professional lives to do that. And I think to market this sport and the women's sport, I don't think we, I think we want to market it for the sport that it is, not what it isn't. Mm. And that's really, really an important piece. A lot of so. people talk about less spitting, which is topical this week, less <laughs> diving, less... Not none, there's not none, as, as Hope will remember against Switzerland a few years ago when uh, goalkeeper Rachel Brown was sent off for... Uh, Oh, picking the ball out of the back of the net, as far as I recall, as opposed to pushing a player in the face. But it's very, very unusual, the fact that we even pick out an incident from a few years ago rather than, say, from last week. But, but Sandra, I would imagine it's a lot easier. I'm not saying your job is easy, by the way. But I'm it saying, is. <laughs> so easy. That's why you've got all day to spend with us. Um, easier to market a national team that's doing pretty well, that's mm -hmm. got superstars such as Christine Sinclair, mm -hmm. and that is hosting a FIFA Women's World Absolutely. Cup. But actually, the real issue is, is underneath, isn't it? The national leagues, and, and we were hearing earlier that not every, mm -hmm. not every nation even allows girls and women to play football, let alone has national leagues. So from a Canada point of view, and from, from the people that you've spoken to in your sphere, uh, and other leagues around the world, how difficult is it to market the national leagues and to get people to watch women's football on television, how much of it is broadcast? Yeah, I think that it's the biggest challenge and we don't for a minute uh, not admit that we're very fortunate in the position we're in, but I think, you know, it, it's, it's actually the scale of what you try to do. So I, I think that what the NWSL has done very effectively this time around is they've recognized that and so they've scaled it to be successful. So you can't always expect to go from A to Z. You have to go somewhere in between to get there. And I think if you try to take something that might be more of, I'm not going to call it a community level event, but somewhere in between and, and, and treat it that way, um, then you're going to have, you're better to be in a 5,000 seat stadium and have it full than a 20,000 seat stadium and have 5,000 people. That's the, the, the most basic comparison I could make, I would say, from a fan and a spectator point of view. So it's, 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 um, it's a relative scale. And, and making the most out of that 5,000 as opposed to trying being something at the 20,000 that you won't get to. 
you have to strive for that 20,000, but you have to, you have to uh, focus on what you can do with that 5,000. And I think NWSL has done that effectively. And you have markets like Portland that has you know, 10,000 regular season ticket holders, and they have a successful formula there. And it works there for them. And other markets are different. And um, you know, we're not involved in the management of that league by any means. But I just, if, if I observe and reflect on, on that success story, it's because the culture of the sport is there. So you have to, you know, in Canada, the, the, the sport of soccer is fairly new. We're, as an association, over 100 years old. But as a fan experience, soccer is a new experience for Canadians. And actually, our women lead that because we've had, you know, over 20,000 people at friendlies very regularly. So, um, and we don't get that for the men. So that we're, we have a real opportunity for women to lead that charge and to, to um, have the soccer culture live in our country. And that's why we see this summer as being a huge opportunity for us to do that. Mm. Kelly, I can vouch for the fact that if a, a big women's football game now isn't on television, um, people are up in arms about it. There, there's a, a lot of feedback mm -hmm. that goes to certain people who are on Twitter <laughs> who would possibly be presenting it were it on the television, which shows how far the game has come. Um, but in terms of the WSL, which is now on, on BT uh, in Great Britain, um, the next challenge really is bums on seats, isn't it? Because broadcasters, I'm sure you'd vouch for this, are much more attracted to showing events which have full stadia and a fantastic atmosphere. Less likely to want to show something, even if the quality on the pitch is good, if there are very few people in the stadium. So Kelly, where do you think you stand in terms of getting those bums on seats and letting people, for example, you probably know I have a bee in my bonnet about the fact that the likes of Chelsea FC, for example, ladies play at Staines and a lot of people in Staines don't even know they play there. How do you get that message across? Yeah. Now, I think it is the, the next big challenge for us, really. Uh, for those who don't know what's sort of been happening in England, England, in England in terms of our top league, um, we sort of ripped it up started again um, to create a product that we thought would move the game on. So we played it across the summer uh, rather than replicating men's football and always going up against men's football. And we wanted to um, target families to come to those games and we felt that the summer period was a better, um, deliver a better experience and encourage more families to come. Um, and we also you know, separated out and sold, sold the rights separately rather than bung them in with men's rights and find you've got partners that are not going to activate in that area. So, so we've really done a lot to, to deliver a professional new product at, at the top end of the game. Um, we've got broadcast coverage, we've got commercial partners. We, our top games are getting around 1,000 fans uh, a game, but we've got to, to increase that number because it, will, it, it gives more, more fans, give more credibility, I guess, to the sport. It makes it a better... Um, experience for the fans, whether you're watching at home in terms of the atmosphere or whether you're there. Um, you hit the nail on the head, 5,000 sellout is much better than seven or 8,000 in a 25,000 seater stadium. The challenge we've got in England, everybody's got different challenges, appreciate that, is that in, your big, in the big cities with your big drive time catchment areas, you've got huge stadiums because of the success of men's football. And therefore, what you find is because you want small stadiums, compact stadiums, and try and pack it as much as possible and deliver a good atmosphere because the broadcasters will kill you if you don't, and rightly so, because nothing worse than broadcasting a live game and nobody's in there, um, is that you end up playing out of the city. And therefore, you've got other challenges around, around that as well. But actually, a, a key objective of ours is to build fans coming to the game, to work with the clubs, Predominantly, the clubs are part of, are integrated into the men's football clubs. Not all of those are the models are like that. But that means that utilising their channels, their, de their fan databases, their communication channels, their season ticket holders, their reach into the community, it's about fully utilising that to pull more fans in. Um, because I think we, we get two types of fans really to the game. Um, families and a lot of dads and daughters. A real chance for dads to have quality time with daughters. And actually, when we had 45,000 at Wembley for the England-Germany game, and you watch them coming up Wembley Way. It was fantastic, wonderful pictures of dads and daughters coming up uh, to the game. It's fantastic to see. And then you get football fans crossing over. So I'm a fan of Chelsea or Liverpool or whatever, and I start to understand and learn more about the women's team and take pride in them and start to come and watch. And those are the two we, we, we heavily going after to bring more fans in. Does that mean it's easier if you've got, say, a Chelsea or a Liverpool or an Everton, whereby it's a well-established men's club, than, say, a Bristol Academy, 
who are not necessarily, they're linked with the Bristol City and, and the Bristol Sport um, group now, mm. but is it easier if, if they are linked with it, a big men's club? Well, do you, pref mean, yeah. do you prefer that? Do you prefer no, that? No, I don't, no, I don't prefer it. I, um, I just think, I mean, Bristol, um, who is sort of linked to an education uh, model, have done a fantastic job in pulling in uh, fans and have some of the highest attendances, and they, they're really well connected in their community and they see there's a high awareness of Bristol and the Bristol community. They've done a really good job of building that fan base. Um, the advantage you've got if you're integrated, properly integrated into men's clubs and increasingly, when I talk to chairman and chief executive of major men's clubs, they talk about this one club vision, this proper integration of the women's team, embedding it in, it means that the women's game, which was three or four years ago, an amateur sport run by volunteers at the top level, He's now got professional marketing, PR, communications, commercial people helping to drive that, engage and build that fan audience. And that's, that's the difference. That's the transformational piece, I think, that's going to help shift the game on professional off-pitch off expertise, helping to commercialise the game, if you like. And Arno, from your perspective, how commercialised do you feel the clubs are in, in engaging with supporters and getting people through the doors and how important is it to you as a broadcaster to have those bums on seats and the atmosphere inside the ground? Yes, yeah, this is, this is a very difficult issue and this is a very good to raise this question. Um, on a daily basis, if I'm talking about the French League, it's, it's a daily fight and uh, the partnership we have with the French Federation to have the right stadiums for the big games. Even the PSG, you know, um, they won't let the woman, the, the, Women PSG playing in the Parc des Princes at all. At all. Uh, in not? Lyon, it's different. The Why big not? games, because you can hear many things. Sometimes uh, people will tell you we want to protect the pitch. <laughs> this is something I have heard many times. Brigitte, you because nobody else plays there, of course. Yeah. Uh, for others, for other clubs, it's because it will cost it costs money you know, to open the big stadiums. Uh, um, we would like to do a. Um, a French Cup semi-final in Saint-Etienne, in Geoffroy Guichard, we would like to have the nice stadium because, as you said, Kelly, the experience is fundamental. You know, if you're watching a, a, a woman games in a nice stadium with, uh, with many people in it, it changes completely the perception. Uh, if you, it's, it's not a compulsory to have a fully packed stadium, but at least to have a, a TV-friendly stadium when you know you can have some great TV experience. But on a you know, daily basis, it's always a fight to say, okay, we want to show this game, okay, but we cannot play there uh, because we won't allow the, 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 the women's team to, to play there, and we have this other stadium, but we are, the lights are not enough you know, to play at night. Okay, so we cannot schedule this, this game at night. So it's week after week, you know, we have to convince, we have to push, uh, for having the best experience possible with a, a stadium that would be TV friendly. Uh, I would say stadium is the first fight. The second one would be uh, to um, bring people to the stadium. Uh, this, is, this is getting better. Um, we have a lack also sometimes, you, you were mentioning it, of I would say 20,000 seats stadium, new modern stadium, which would be perfect for women football. Uh, because I think it's now in, um, we have this experience in France or in Germany, uh, you can have between 10,000 and 20,000, uh, you know, attendance for big games. Uh, the French team is now playing in stadiums uh, fully packed between 20,000 and 30,000. So the, the, I would say there is an, attra an attraction for that. But if you're a spectator, you, you need to have a comfort, you know. You don't want to be freezing during the winter, uh, in a windy stadium that is not comfortable and, and everything. So it, this is part also of, the, of this experience. But the main thing is to let the women play in, the, in, in, in TV friendly stadiums with a nice experience for, for the people who are coming to watch the game. Moya. Yeah, can I say something about, about this idea that uh, audiences aren't interested in watching women play sport? Because I, I just don't believe it. I think we should debunk that right now. Um, let's, let's wind the clock back a little bit to when men's professional football was in its early phases, in the, around the time of the First World War. And, you know, it, it's a really interesting lesson in history. When you look at that period, the men went off to war 
uh, it was in you know, the, the early industrial period, so there were factories, there was, there was this idea of a five and a half day week where people knocked off at Saturday at lunchtime and then at three o'clock there was a game on. So you, know, you were starting to get these conditions in which professional football could, could form and could thrive. And in the middle of that came the First World War. The men went off to war, the women went into the factories where the men had been, and guess what? They formed football teams and they started to play against each other. And in that brief period of history when you know, there was no men's football being played, women's football absolutely thrived. It took off like a rocket. And by the end of the First World War, when the men came home, went back into the factories, the women went back home, they still played football for a few years. And it was immensely popular. If, if you look at the data from uh, 1920 in, in England, 53,000 people went to watch two women's teams play at Goodison Park. 53,000 people. That was the best attended game of the year. The best attended men's game of the year in the top league in England was, uh, I think, 38,000. So more people at that time went to watch women play high-level football than went to watch men play high-level football. Unfortunately, the following year it was banned by the FA and women's football remained banned for most of the last years. century, for 50 years. Until 79. Um, but it didn't begin. Uh, it, the starting point was not that uh, people are somehow disinterested in watching women play football. In fact, it was quite the opposite. And maybe that's why you know, it was felt that getting the vote, getting into the workforce, getting onto the football field was just kind of one liberation too many at the time and, and it was banned. But, you know... We're not asking, if, if you're a TV uh, broadcaster, if you're a sponsor, um, you know, th do yourself a favour, do your viewers a favour and, and give them access to a product that is compelling to watch. It's high, the, the best level of women's football these days is highly watchable. It's really good viewing and in many ways, as people will often tell me, they, they prefer to watch it because of its qualities, because of its freshness, its difference. Um, and, in the end, I don't think it competes head to head with men's football for viewers or for audiences or in the end for sponsorship dollars because I think it creates variety in the game. And we all know that variety, you know, it's one of the, the, the rules of retail economics that variety increases consumption. This is why there are 20 flavours of ice cream when you go into the ice cream shop. This is why there are 10 different kinds of toothpaste when you go into the supermarket. It's because you buy more toothpaste that way. You buy more ice cream if there's lots of different flavours. And women's football is different to watch to men's football. It's a different experience in the stadium, but it increases consumption. Uh, it increases the overall consumption of football. Uh, it increases your market size. I mean, you wouldn't sell Coca-Cola just to men, right? You wouldn't. <laughs> so, you know, do yourself a favour. This is a vast new audience which uh, it, it takes some, uh, you know, somebody had the vision to invest in men's football. Right? Somebody had the vision to pay a lot of money for the rights, uh, to invest in stadia, to invest in, in, in cameras, multiple camera angles around, around the ground. Um, and you know, my, my view is that women's football is just as good an investment opportunity as men's football ever was. I mean, if we were a, if we were a stock, we'd be a buy, wouldn't we? I mean, you've got the most popular game in the world. You've got half the population that hasn't really been served it and you've got the chance to do it. I mean, what can go wrong? Well, it's simple, really. <laughs> simple, it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Moya eloquently stating the case for why you must buy women's football, why you must go and watch it, why you must put it on your televisions, and why you must invest in it. Uh, I hope some of the sponsors are watching this broadcast on FIFA.com, by the way. If you are, do feel free to tweet in and tell us how you're going to do your bit. Um, Isha, from your perspective, what are your views on the marketing of women's football and also incorporated in that, the, the bums on seats? Do you believe there is a huge well, amount of scope for people coming along to watch women's football? Well, I mean, it, from a European uh, point of view, which, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to sit here and, and debate. I'd, I'd rather more talk about from the African. Mm. Of course, of, obviously, it's a growing market, and I, I totally endorse with what has been said. In terms of Africa, I, I can say that um, even though we have a long way to go, um, there's an increasing um, desire to watch female football. They love watching it on DSTV and, 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 and the World Cup is going to create a lot of interest from what I'm hearing as well. But even internally, 
uh, with our little local matches that we have. And last year, this time, we had Liberia coming to Sierra Leone to play a friendly. And there must have been a turnout. I know this is just a, a tiny drop in the ocean, but um, that, that uh, turf, that arena in McCain, in the town, um, we don't have a stadium as such, but it took 8,000 people. Now, that is record, record sales. It was amazing. And, and we're talking about a, a town, not a village, but a town, where, again, the mentality is such where women's place is in the home. And uh, to, to, to ha have to see all these men coming out in numbers to watch and support uh, female football was extremely encouraging. So I, I say that, yes, um, I, there should be a lot more marketing. What we're hoping to do with the youth football league that will start hopefully this year is to get our first partners in terms of marketing would be UNICEF for the obvious reasons of, um, of uh, uh, women, children and the support. Uh, UNICEF will probably help us to, to get the marketing together. We will probably be looking to um, the distributors for LucasAid and sports drinks and stuff like that. We would take it that angle uh, um, and so that we can actually have a we, we could make a case, if you like, for, for them having to support. Otherwise, you can't really market it because it, it just isn't there. So we would say to UNICEF, listen, you guys represent women and children. Come on board and be a lead sponsor for the Female Youth League. And then we would go to the sports distributors, like I said, and, and you know, just, just make a case. But, um, I, you know, marketing is a little bit of my background, so I'm really looking forward to having to see how we can build that in our society, market and, and PR, the sport as a, as a healthy thing and not something that, you know, we're, we're trying to force down uh, people's throats, that it's, it's healthy for women to engage in sports, it's healthy for women to play football, there's nothing derogatory about it. Um, football is such a powerful tool mm -hmm. and if the men can use football in our society to lobby their politics and God knows what else, why can't the women do that? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, use the same football uh, playing as a tool to um, send messages across a lot more um, to the home, so yes. Sandra, as a marketeer, is it very different marketing a women's sport than a men's sport, particularly football? Um, you know what I've done, like I've done, I've worked in sports where I've marketed to women and men, but I wanted to just follow up on what you're saying because that's a great story that needs to be told about 8,000 people. Mm. Those are the types of stories that need to be told around women and football because that tells the story of how it affects both on and off the pitch. Yes. And I, I go back to our slogan for this term, it's about what we can do not only on the field of play but off the field of play and, and we feel very responsible for that. Our players in Canada have always felt very responsible for that. Um, they don't, they want to leave a legacy behind from this tournament and it's about the difference we're making and I actually want to talk to you after about something with you and Seth when you talk to me about that, right. about something that, uh, a partner that we have. But. Um, so, um, your, sorry, your question was just in relation to the Marketing of men's and women's football, how different is it? You know what, um, in Canada, I can speak to Canada, it's really, it's more of a family demographic, I think similar to what you're saying, Kelly. Um, definitely, um, you know, one hour after any of our women's national team matches, they stay and sign autographs mm -hmm. in the stadium. They are role models, these girls come to the matches, they come with their fathers, they come with their mothers, the families come. So that's definitely where we focus our energies. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that for the Women's World Cup that's our priority because it's not about just the families, it's about the sport. So it really does um, go to the sports fan as well. Um, in Canada, our men's team is very much more of the traditional um, soccer fan, football fan. Sorry, in Canada, we still call it soccer. We'd like to call Play it off. football. We really want to, but we have this other silly football sport they play. So, um, anyways, but uh, so yeah, it's just. I mean, that's the within our national teams, we definitely have a different approach. But but the people who invest in our sport um, invest in it for the reasons you talk about. Um, they invest in it and that's why I raised it at the beginning. If, if we didn't have that grassroots connection and that sense mm -hmm. of community, they wouldn't be investing in our sport. I can honestly tell you that. It's not about, we haven't had performance on the pitch until 2012. So, and, and we have historically had a lot of investment in our sport because of the numbers we have. I mean, the survey talked about 47% of all registered members are from Canada and the US. Those are eyeballs. And if a, if a sponsor is investing in a sport, they're investing in it because of the numbers. And the numbers are 
you know, if you don't have the numbers on TV, because I can tell you our numbers of our, uh, our broadcast numbers are probably six figures for our national team matches, but they're not much bigger than that for national team matches. But, but you automatically have 850,000 registered members you can connect with. So it's not hard to do the math on that. If you can give them both, even better. And that's when it's real magic for, for someone. And, and so we have partners who are involved with us um, as an association that will, I think, do as much to help us make the World Cup a success, within the branding guidelines, of course, <laughs> um, as, as our FIFA partners will, just because they're supporting Canada for no other reason than they're supporting Canada and delivering that message for us. And, and that's what every member federation wants to be doing. We need all 23 participating nations' countries to be talking about this event in their countries. We know some of them are. Um, we know we've met with all the consulates in Canada who are spreading that message in Canada for us, and they're spreading it back home, and they're encouraging their visitors to come during our time. But we need those member associations to be doing the same. And I really believe that if people are looking for partners to invest in their, their uh, federations, the grassroots programming is as desirable to invest in as the national teams, because there's there's just more opportunity, there's more nuances, there's more of an ability to tell your story as a corporation through those pieces. So that combination is really where where I think you can have the most impact. So I think you have incredible opportunities, and I can't even imagine, you know, I, I sit here and think about what we do, and, and we just do not have the challenges that, that you face. And But I think some of the, the, the lessons learned um, can be applied in every situation, and I, I think there's huge opportunities for you. Absolutely, sure. Thank you. Isn't it, we've talked about the development and increasing standard of women's football at different stages across the world, and also we talked about the marketing and branding and broadcasting of the, the more elite levels of women's football. The one thing that links the two entities are players and former players. Now, in the very handily timed uh, arrival of the... 10 FIFA key women's football development principles. One of them is number six, former players and referees, particularly important to women's football development because they've lived through the challenges and have commitment and accumulated expertise. They should be targeted for development, leadership and management opportunities. This is a slightly loaded question because I think I know the answer to it. Is that being done enough? Are former players in individual associations around the world and from clubs who've done great things for their clubs, people such as Rebecca Smith here, are they being utilised enough to inspire the next generation and to be a marketing link between the clubs and the sport and the local community and putting bums on seats? Who'd like to answer that? I'll throw it over to the floor in a minute, by the way. Please, Kelly. I think as a football federation, our responsibility starts earlier than, uh, than when they just retire because, um, see, for many countries, the women are probably paying to play, even at the top level, um, certainly not earning a living. And even if they are earning a living, they're not going to retire like some of the men do on a, a massive wealth uh, and be able to sort of pick their roles going forward. So I think, you know, we have a responsibility because we've taken those women, in our country, we've taken those women out of the game at key either moments in education or key moments in their career to play football and therefore we've got responsibility to support them and, and through lifestyle management to help them think about their careers post, uh, post football. Um, I think we're improving on the way we do that. We have got a partnership with the PFA, our professional footballers association, who are investing in players' um, careers. We've got uh, England players doing a journalism degree funded by the PFA, um, we've got uh, players doing their B licence, A licence, who already committed, they want to go back into coaching and managing, they can see now a career which they couldn't have before because there are full time coaches right through the England youth teams, right through the WSL, um, they can see a career for it, so we're identifying those that want to go into coaching, supporting them, giving them the qualifications, uh, mentoring, um, opportunities to coach uh, alongside, something that hope started and drove um, when she was uh, at, the, at the FA. So I think it's really important, it's a really important role. We, there's you know, a huge amount of expertise, as you said, that we need to harness and keep in the game. And I think we've got responsibility to do it for a number of reasons. Isn't that a win-win situation, Moya, when you look at, um, so take for example somebody who 
who is an inspiration, I think is an inspiration at least, and I'm sure many people do, uh, in our country, Faye White, who is a, a great leader of the England national women's team for many years. And she, she does still work in the game for, for Arsenal ladies. She has a little child now as well. But I would imagine that somebody like her going into school, like maybe not a, a full-time job, but something she could fit around her childcare. I mean, she might have a say in this herself, of course. But just as an example, somebody going into schools and talking to them about her experiences of playing in World Cups and maybe not mentioning the penalty shootout so much, um, and, but talking about what football has given her and inspiring those young girls. Would somebody like that replicated across, all across the country, across Europe, across the world, have a big impact in inspiring young girls and in increasing the numbers of participants and the feeling for them that there is somewhere for them to go? Absolutely, and I think uh, this principle came about uh, it arose out of a lot of discussions that were had and, and the, uh, the, the same problem that you heard echoed around the world, which was a lack of uh, role models in the game for others to see. Uh, I remember as a kid, the only, the only female sports figures I can remember were an Olympic runner and a tennis player. I mean, there just were no female footballers to look at when I was a kid. Um, so it's very important, now that we have them, to make sure that they're seen. Um, I think it's also important to keep them in the game because, uh, first of all, it delivers meaningful career paths to others who are deciding what to do with their lives when they're 17 or 18. Do I stay in the game? Do I go? Um, but I think it all, it's also because they have an enormous contribution to give to the game. I think if you look at any sport, uh, the contribution of the former athletes of those sports has been critical in the advancement of it. And uh, in women's football, it is, you know, it's a lot harder to stay in the game. There's not so many jobs in the game. Um, there's not too many you know, ways to get paid for being involved in women's football. It's tough on ex-players, on coaches especially, on female coaches who for some reason never seem to be offered many jobs coaching men's football, which is where most of the jobs are. But you know, there, there are so many um, reasons for, for women to drop out of the game once they hang up their boots that I think you have to work a little bit harder to make sure that they stay involved. Why? Because they have accumulated expertise. Uh, they have, you may have noticed when you heard Beck Smith speaking, when you heard Honey speaking, they have a kind of fire in their belly that uh, is, is something that will, you know, light up the game all around the world. And, you know, these are the people who will give you uh, consistent, credible expertise in running the game in every country around the world. So you really need to keep them involved. They're too important a resource to just let, um, you know, fall out of the game. Uh, and, and one of the, I think one of the challenges that's been kind of alluded to by many people this morning is the fact that you know, men's football, especially at the professional end of the game, uh, is so big and uh, dominant in, in the sporting landscape that it's kind of difficult for you know, this little game to turn up you know, 50 years later and try and make a place for itself in the shade of this enormous uh, juggernaut that is men's football. Uh, and one of the things you see happen sometimes is a real stop-start thing. It's a boom and bust and, you know, we, oh, we had it for a while but then that person left and it fell in a hole and, uh, you know, to, to keep a consistent effort in uh, managing and promoting and developing the women's game bears enormous uh, uh, dividends. I mean, you see sometimes quite small countries who make an effort at something and you think, wow, you know, how, how did that happen? Where did that come from? Costa Rica is a good example. I mean, this is a country of, what, five million people or so, hosted an under-17 Women's World Cup. They've done extraordinarily well in men's football as well. And where did that come from? Well, they, they, they had a bit of a go at it. They made a consistent effort at it, and it, um, it earned them enormous uh, dividends across both sides of the game in, in promoting football. So, you know, I think the, the former practitioners of the game are people who are there, they're passionate, they have experience, they have accumulated learning, and they have a huge amount to give back. Uh, and it's especially hard for them to stay in the game, so you know, find ways to make it happen, I would yeah. say. So people need to pay them, basically, is what needs to happen for them to turn it into a job, which means, presumably, associate former clubs might struggle to be able to pay them to do that. They would have to do something such as maybe what Faye is doing, which is with Arsenal, which is doing a good job there on the marketing side of things. But money is part of the answer, but it's not all the answer. Sometimes it's, it's a role. Um, I mean, w women's sport is not well remunerated throughout the world, and if everyone who wasn't getting paid went home, well, I, I hate to think where we'd be. Uh, so often it's, it's 
it's a role that's been given the opportunity to contribute in a meaningful way. That of itself is something that I think uh, many many people find very inspiring. Being made inspiring. to feel welcome and wanted back at the club. It, it just seems an absolute no-brainer, doesn't it? Sandra, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just like role models is everything that is our women's team. That's who these women are. They are unbelievable people. And I clearly remember talking to them back in 2009 in Germany after they just lost five to nothing. And it was a pretty low point for the team. And they were pretty frustrated that we weren't doing enough for them as a federation at that point. And, and our, our, our comment to them was, trust us. We're going to, you know, the World Cup's going to happen. We're going to have opportunities for you. And we're going to be able to tell your story. And, and what, what role models can do for this sport and, and bring other girls into the sport and all the good things. And, and, and that's happened. We can't keep up with the request for them for appearances. They're paid mm -hmm. opportunities. It's not always about making money, but for them, we actually get to give them opportunities. I have a staff member on the Canada soccer side. It's his job now. That's all he has time to do. Um, it, and, you know, it's all the players. It's not just Christine. It's everybody because they all have a great story to tell. And those are people who will stay involved with us. We're adamant about that, creating roles for these individuals. We had a player, Cara Lang, who some of you may know that was trying to make a comeback and couldn't. She was the first ambassador we announced for this tournament. And she's been phenomenal at spreading the word and supporting it. And she's a broadcaster like yourself now, Jackie. So, so there are roles. You figure out where the roles are. Some of our newly retired players are coaching with our U15 team, for example, just recently through some CONCACAF programs. You find the roles. You create opportunities, and nobody drives that more than our senior leaders, John, and his role is always talking to us about what can we do for these players, what can we do for them, and, and we're, as a federation, trying to fulfill that need, and the Canadian public wants them part of their lives, so that's a great, it's a win-win for everybody, and they're having an impact. They're really, uh, they're really motivating a lot of young Canadians. Yeah, because you certainly need somebody like Christine Sinclair, who's perhaps coming towards the end of her career, you need to keep her on in, in some visible role model capacity. Really keen to bring in Rebecca Smith again on this, if we could give you a microphone, I think I'm attached, <laughs> if I could just pass this on to you, to give your views on, um, on the retention, the lack of retention of women's players in the game, both from a, a coaching and developmental point of view, also from a marketing point of view. Um, what are your thoughts and, and how can they be retained and, and who's going to pay them? Yeah, I think personally it's a, it's a fantastic topic to bring up. It was something that I probably should have mentioned in mind, but is the dual career of the female footballer, which is very different from the male footballer. The male footballer goes to work every morning as a football player. The female footballer goes to work in the morning as a footballer, then goes to school, or then goes to their second job, and then comes back to their first role as a footballer. And I think that that's something that probably won't change in the future. Um, as female footballers go through their career, they're not gonna retire knowing that they're millionaires and, and can just finish their their life being a footballer, period. So it's that process during the time that they're playing that's so important. And Sandra mentioned, which was really interesting, it's the responsibility, I think, not just of the player to make sure that they are following up on an education or getting a job, a second job while they're playing, but also the responsibility of the federation and or club and or FIFA um, to make sure that these players are actually um, being supported in their second role because they all have them. Um, so not only do we have less regeneration time because they're going from their sport to their second job, um, which then goes into more injuries, which is a whole other topic, um, but they also need that support from the federations. When a player starts playing, they don't play because they think they're going to be a millionaire. They don't start playing because they think they're going to be Christine Sinclair, or maybe they do, and that's fantastic, and they should keep, keep believing that. But at the end of the day, um, a lot of girls, they don't get to that point where they can really live off of that. And I think it's a responsibility throughout the way um, that the federations and clubs support players. Um, one example which I really like is what the DFB does, the German Football Association. They have a coaching um, pro program throughout where the players, they go and they get their licenses. So they have an actual break in their seasons where they go and, and they go through the coaching license program. So in that way, they retain their players to then become coaches, which are obviously they become great coaches because they've experienced it as players. Um, so there's plenty of examples where different federations like the CSA, like the DFB, do things to retain those players, but I think we actually, it's nice to talk about it, but there needs to be something actually done. Um, there needs to be those structures put in place so that there are programs that are supported by FIFA, by federations, by clubs, that ensure that those players are actually having a dual career and being able to then retire and stay in the game and keep fighting and keep having that fire in their belly to um, bring back something to women's football. From a marketing standpoint, it's obvious why we need them. So, 
So there's a, a concrete suggestion as to a solution to not just one of the issues, but probably covering all the topics that we've talked about is the former players having more of a role. Can you, I yeah? On that. I think I'll that take questions from the floor after that. Male football should show more signs of caring about female football. Uh, I remember the, the buzz, you know, there was this official f f photo with both the male and female teams of Arsenal together. That's very st a very strong sign. Uh, we can think also having male, very f famous former champions, you know, um, that can be involved in female football development also. Uh, on TV, on Eurosport, we have some female and male consultants. They are both talking about male and female football. Mm -hmm. We need to create more bridges. Uh, you cannot imagine the impact it has when you have, I don't know, the French uh, coach uh, when, he, when, when he's attending the, 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 the female French national team, the game, because it shows that male's football cares about female football. So I think we have to think about that also, how we can create more bridges and uh, having symbols. Uh, I would love to see also some official national peaks with both the female and the male teams together. Uh, that, that, would be, that would be nice. And it's also talking, something I've mentioned over the years, but. Um there's not a great deal of it, is it's free marketing. Getting, as a wild example, someone like Steven Gerrard to be talking about women's football or to show up at a, a Liverpool ladies match. I mean, they are double champions. They're, they're not some part timers you know. Um, somebody like John Terry to show up at Staines or any of the Chelsea players to start, show up at Staines. Once it gets out there that John Terry's at Staines watching the women's team, then instantly everybody knows that's where Chelsea ladies play. Exactly. It's free. Yeah. It's free marketing. And it's, it's, it's just an idea, isn't it? It's one simple idea that would have so much of a crossover. I gather there's um, somebody from the uh, French FA is here, continuing the, uh, the Arnaud Simon French theme, um, who would like to talk, is it, on this issue? Don't be shy. We have a microphone. Oh, it's over there. In uh, France in 2009, nobody spoke about women's football or the national women's team. And then our communications department really wanted to put their foot down. And then they started a campaign. So that really created a buzz, uh, two, three days in the media, and then it just fell flat. So perhaps that was not the best instrument, but I think what brings people into the stadium nowadays brings people to watch uh, women's matches on TV. It's the quality of the game. This is what we heard before, and I think that the Federation really concentrated on that as of uh, 2011. There was a good performance on the pitch, there was a performance, and then the media started concentrating on that because then, after 2011, then they became interested in the league, not so much in the national team. And then, of course, the show, the spectacle on the pitch, the quality in a stadium, which is adapted to the uh, number of people. So even if it's only 5,000, but if the stadium is packed full, fine. So what we want is to bring in the people and to bring in the school to watch matches of the national team and of the league. And uh, so it's important for marketing also to have uh, outstanding personalities there, celebrities. But I think we went more for a long-term grassroots policy to start working on it. And we know it's going to take some time. And also tell we have to tell our broadcasters, hey, concentrate on the quality of the game, create a good atmosphere, a family atmosphere in the stadium. And then the sponsors and the partners will really have the possibility to concentrate on that. Bring in the uh, VIPs. We don't want just one shots. We are looking for the long term. So 
Looking at problems we have faced in the development, well, Noël Legret, who is the first president of the association who is convinced by women's football, but also convinced that women have a higher position in society, and he also has uh, this possibility of using the complementarity of men and women in the sport, and in uh, France, uh, since 2011, with Noël Le Gret, we have um, marvelous results. We have 35,000 more licensed players. We have uh, more, 400 more educators and trainers. So I think this is a huge step forward for France. So after three years, and when we talk about feminization, we are now really reaching out to everybody and something that I would add as an activity for the future is that we have now embarked on the idea of giving more importance to women in football and in the whole family. Everybody is winning. It's a win-win situation. The women's football is now becoming more important and uh, now the figures are increasing, it's being broadcast more frequently on TV, it's in the media, and uh, we have realized that the phase we're in is that football in clubs and associations in our regional institutions, football is still run by men. And the question is, how can we bring these men more towards uh, women they're used to playing uh, wood boys and young men, but there's so much to be done in the regional associations as well. It's a matter of convincing them, but also beyond convincing them is telling them that there's room for women, room for everybody, and women also can be presidents of regional associations and leagues. Why not? And we have also former female players in France who can take that role. So that's what I wanted to say. We just want to help men face these new possibilities. Yeah. Uh, and for those watching online, Arno is kind enough to, uh, to uh, sum up some of the points that were made there for us. Uh, you mean from, from the, the yeah. last intervention? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. Of, of course, I think that the more men will be involved in that process, the better. That was what Brigitte was saying. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, because this is also our interest. And this is the interest of football. Um, and uh, I feel really quite comfortable to push for, for women's football as a man. Um, because I really do think that it is the sense of history. And so you cannot, we cannot miss that. That would be a, a strong mistake uh, as a trend. And as, as I said at the beginning, as a, on, the, on the business point of view, as you said, uh, this is so evident then that women and football will be the greatest combination in the sport universe and maybe more than that in the next years. Uh, for in every single aspect, for society, for marketing, for, uh, for football in general, because at, I think it will help bringing more families into the stadiums, uh, maybe less violence sometimes also, because the more you have families in the stadiums, the more you will have women, the less aggressive uh, the, the attendance will be, that's for sure. So this is, I would say, a, a 360 interest that uh, a women's, uh, that women's football development has to grow uh, strongly. Mm. We've got half an hour left before lunch. I'd like to take some questions from the floor and also put some of the tweets from people who've been watching and following online around the world uh, to some of our panellists. Um, first of all, don't worry, I think they've been vetted first. Don't worry. <laughs> um, at Just a Ball Game has asked, what are FIFA's plans to tackle discrimination and make the women's game a safe environment for all to play? Which is going to have to be one for you, Moya. <laughs> um, well, that's a very good question because we see... Uh, instances, and not isolated instances either, of uh, women getting a fairly tough time for participating in the sport. And that's not just in the least developed countries, that's uh, that, I don't want to pick on England, well actually I'm Australian so yeah, I sort of do want to tease England, but 
<laughs> it's kind of a national duty. Really. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are some instances that have been highlighted overnight um, by the Women in Football group in England about some of the abuse that female officials suffer when they're officiating at matches in England. And, you know, this isn't, isn't some Sunday pub team. This is Premier League uh, uh, teams with cameras all over the ground and at the very highest levels of the, of the game, uh, the, the club game in England. Um, so I think um, when you see uh, instances of abuse or discrimination occurring, um, you have to act. And I think uh, it's, it's not just for the victim to complain, although there have to be legitimate channels for her to do that, uh, but it's also for everybody who's um, a part of that event, who's observing it, to stand up and step forward and say, you know, it really is not okay to be chanting uh, lewd things to a female official who's on the field attending to a player who's injured. That is really not acceptable. You wouldn't do that in a hospital waiting room and we're not going to do it in the stadium either. And, you know, these things need to be called out. I mean, there are, of course, there, there is a regulatory framework in FIFA that sets out um, principles of non-discrimination, there are ethics codes, there are disciplinary codes. You know, you, you can put all of these structures in place, but in the end it comes down to enforcement. It comes down to the willingness of people to report and to enforce uh, the consequences of this kind of behaviour. That's one part of the solution. I think the other part of the solution is to help people understand just why it's so um, uh, unacceptable for this behaviour to occur in the first place. And I think any behavioural change begins with a realisation as to, uh, or an empathy as to its consequences. So I think um, the more, uh, you know, if you can put yourselves in the, in the shoes of the person who is being uh, discriminated against, if you can get your head around what it is that they're experiencing, uh, then I think that's an important first step in understanding why you shouldn't do that. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's whether you're a victim of physical abuse, verbal abuse, um, uh, you know, people sort of sniggering at you, uh, um, making fun of your involvement. All of those things have, have a price. They have a price in the, the well-being and the self-esteem of the person who's being excluded. And that's a very real price that the game plays, uh, that the game pays and that the individual pays. And uh, I think, you know, the, the, I think the most powerful thing is if everyone who sees it calls it out. Report abuse and enforce sanctions. That's something that's been called for by the Women in Football group, which I'm uh, a board member of, and the, the abuse, uh, the footage that's um, emerged in the last 24 hours or so of the Chelsea club doctor, men's club doctor, uh, Eva Carnero, um, which she receives a lot of the time when she comes onto the football field. It's just not something that's been particularly reported about before. Uh, there are many other forms of discrimination which are more widely reported. Gender discrimination seems to be a lot more, um, a lot more accepted, perhaps, in, in the wider public, would you say? Kelly, what can be done, do you think, now, uh, now that that has been reported? What sort of sanctions can be implemented by the FA, would you say? Yeah, well, no, I think, I think you both sort of hit the nail on the head, really. I think... Um, the reporting mechanisms are there. Um, there are um, stadia regulations that prohibit that. Um, there are football regulations that prohibit all forms of discrimination. There are sanctions that are available to the football bodies. I think, certainly in England um, and in other countries, a huge amount has been done to tackle racism in football. Um, still more to, always more to do, but a huge amount, a real commitment from the football authorities to tackle racism. Increasingly so, homophobia in football. And I, it feels like kind of sexism in football is coming in from, from, from behind those two. And I think it's absolutely um, vital that football federations tackle sex discrimination, gender discrimination with, with the same. You it's vital so really that it other forms what, of discrimination. What will actually happen? What practically can be imposed? Well, so um, if there's a a breach of the stadium regulations, then um, you know, obviously the stewards have training, um, all the people involved in the clubs have training about appropriate behaviour, that can be reported, if they can be identified through where they're sitting, you can put life bans 
um, um, and, and often the threat of that and in, the threat of enforcing that um, you know, can, can change behaviour. Well. Is the will so, there, so the state do you think, regulation is there for gender there. discrimination? Hmm? Is, is the will there, do you think, to enforce that for gender discrimination as well as the others? Are the stewards briefed? I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot yeah, no, here, right, but yeah. are they no, briefed, they are briefed strongly about gender yeah, discrimination? Yeah, very much so, yeah. Um, I, I think it's one of the first... I haven't read a lot about this case. I don't report about this case because I, I haven't really had a chance to sort of read about it. I think it'd be one of those the first ones to come through. We've seen... Um, you know, stadium clubs um, through the stadium regs, you know, tackle some of the issues around racism, around xenophobia, around homophobia. Um, there's been some some key work um, with some of the clubs uh, around tackling that within the stadiums. This is one of the first ones I think that's been really raised the public profile around gender discrimination, sex discrimination um, in in stadiums. So it'd be really interesting to see how that is tackled. And I think it's just. You know, to reiterate, really, it's so vital that football federations treat all forms of discrimination with the same fervour. Isha, what are your views on uh, gender discrimination and, and the way it's tackled? I, I, I honestly do believe that um, FIFA should come on board and to see how best um, they, they, they can um, deal with this situation and, if need be, to impose the strictest... Um, uh, I don't, don't want to use the word harsh, but the strictest sanctions possible. Because sitting here as uh, the head of my FA, I've been exposed to all kinds of uh, gender discrimination and it's become really quite, quite nasty, if I may use that word. But I'm not going to sit here and start feeling sorry for myself. I never do, or start playing that gender card, or oh, woe on to me, I'm a woman. But you see, in our, in our setting as well, I'll cut back again to the culture, why is it that the women or young girls and their parents do not feel particularly uh, keen to get into football? It's because they're sensitive. Uh, as women, we shouldn't be on that pitch anyway, in the first place. And if you're there, you don't want to be subjected to insults. You don't want to be subjected to shame or what have you. And I look at my instance, if, if as the head of the FA, young girls who look up to me as, as an inspiration and role model, they see me being uh, hurled abuse, is being hurled at me, I'm having to take the knocks, I'm being pulled back from having to uh, uh, develop the game and bring in ethics and discipline uh, simply because I'm a woman. Do you know, what, what, um, what good is that in terms of inspiration? How far can that take us, or, or the young women? So I really do think that um, FIFA should look at these, you know, in terms of their disciplinary policies and what have you. And if it means they're being one-sided a little bit or biased, then so be it. Because it's all about helping lift uh, the game for young women. So I do strongly believe, Moya, that you should look into that. Can I add, I think one of the challenges of this is actually that it is so, so widespread and endemic yeah. in football that if you began to enforce these things literally, uh, you know, it would come as an enormous shock. Uh, let me give an example. Um, anyone who watches uh, professional men's football and can lip read knows that uh, referring to somebody as a female is an insult that's often used on the pitch. Yeah, a reference to a body part, or or uh, it's an insult to refer to someone as being female. Now, you know, I really find it offensive that somebody should refer to my gender as an insult. Since when is my gender an insult? Right? But this is kind of commonplace. And uh, you see it, um, any, as I said, anyone who can lip read knows that this happens on the field. If you refer to somebody by their colour or race on the football field, you are dealt with uh, in a pretty clear way. If you refer to somebody, uh, if you insult somebody by referring to gender on the football field, not much happens, I've noticed. You know, maybe that's a place to start. It's being female is not an insult in the, in the when you've crossed that white line and you're in the field of play. It's not acceptable as an insult in the stand or on the field. Um, let's call that one out. Okay, we're going to have to be quite brief with all our points now because we have tw just under 20 minutes before the break. Would anybody from the floor like to come in on that point or any other points? If we could sort of make all our points quite clear and succinct, that would be fantastic. Then we can get in as many of you as possible and also a few more of our tweets. 
So, microphone. Oh, is it just this one? You can take this one. I don't need it. Thanks. And please do identify yourselves, if you wouldn't mind, once the microphone reaches you. Oh, there we go. Uh, hello, my name is Christiana Daneva. I come from Bulgaria. I'm a sports activist. Um, I'm also a board member of the European Gay and Lesbian Sports Federation. And last year, uh, thanks to the help of FAIR, uh, we managed to organize the first Sports Tolerance Festival, which focused around women's football and promoting tolerance via using the forms of art, films, and debates. Uh, I'm introducing the, the, con the context because it is important. My, my question is, how and what can FIFA and international bodies do to, to influence for once, let's say, Bulgarian Football Association, Ministry of Sport, uh, and International Olympic Committee, in order to acknowledge for once the fact that there is such a thing as women's football. In Bulgaria we have eight non-professional leagues and homophobia and discrimination on the basis of racism is a clear fact. My sister is a football player, I'm not. I'm an activist. I like to say that, my, my <laughs> that being an activist is, uh, in, in my setting is an extreme sport. And uh, uh, it would really, well, let's say, in, in, in my cultural background, in order to make a difference, in order to make a say, international important voices need to be heard. People like you, inspirational voices like you. And I would like to use this opportunity to invite you and to, to, to begin a dialogue in order to, to, to try to influence the Bulgarian Football Association, all of these bodies, which I introduced myself personally to, invited them on behalf of a FAIR network and received absolutely no response and no presence. Thank you. Is that something you want to pick up on or can pick up on? I'm happy to make a couple of comments in response to that. Firstly, thank you for your question. And uh, I'm happy to add my voice to those who say that it is important that people uh, of all persuasions are able to fully participate. Um, it's, it's not a game for white heterosexual males. <laughs> uh, maybe people perceived it that way once in the past, but it absolutely is not anymore. And it's important that your voice is there uh, and that you join others, uh, other voices who were there, to, uh, to make sure that women are welcomed and accepted uh, in the game and to make sure that uh, people of all sexualities are welcomed and accepted in the game. I know Piara Pau is here and I'm sure he'll say more about this in the panel this afternoon. But um, uh, again, the, 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 there is a regulatory framework in world football that says it is not okay to discriminate on, uh, against people on the basis of sexual orientation. And I'm glad to say that that is, I think, reflected in most of the confederation uh, regulatory regimes around the world as well. So it is there. It is an accepted principle that's been signed on uh, by, by everyone in the game. Uh, the challenge is to truly put that into practice. And that is a matter of persuading minds and hearts to open around the world to make sure that everyone is embraced. Okay, we have 15 minutes left, so again, we, we need to sort of race through a few points. I'd like to put to the floor, perhaps somebody from, the, and then we will come to you, I promise, your hand's been up. Um, put to the floor a question from at Christina Mang on Twitter. What can girls do to be noticed by the European clubs and have opportunities to play there when they're in countries such as mine, Armenia? Is there anybody in the floor who's able to answer that question? How can players, talented young players, who are from, say, developing women's football nations, get to play for European clubs? Anybody, somebody in this room must be able to answer a question. I think it's a really good question. I think a lot of the clubs would have trials. Um, How do they get trials? So they probably need to contact the club, if they can get video footage of their, of their performances, I'm sure that would help um, before trying to make the travel across to... We can all look good on YouTube though, like Kelly. <laughs> but, well, um, I couldn't. Yeah, it's make, make, make a connection with the club. Okay. I think Rebecca mm. talked about it earlier, you made calls, you asked for tryouts, mm, and, yeah. and it's creating I mean, videos, anything like that as well. I just, and I wanted to just make one comment about um, your, um, what we can do. I think as, an, as a 
uh, MA, we can provide the platform for our players who want to speak about those issues um, uh, to do that. And we've actually had a couple of our players um, recently speaking about IOC issues related to uh, not discrimination, just a movement towards um, ensuring that there wasn't. Um, and um, we've had them, we've provided them those platforms and, and as an MA we're very committed to that with our players um, in allowing them to have that voice and be role models for, you, for young girls and, and, and boys who, who are dealing with the same issues. So as an MA that's, that's a priority for us for sure, just so you know. Okay, there's a lady who's had a hand up for quite some time. Can we get the microphone to the lady in the centre? If you could identify yourself, please. Hi, um, my name is Teresa Aguilar. I head up a sports um, uh, um, consultancy and a marketing company. And I have a very quick comment, especially towards Kelly. I'm Spanish, I live in London. I have two little daughters. Um, who go to football classes on the weekends and they're actually the only girls in their class. And it has been hard for me to get them to persevere, firstly because of the English weather, which unfortunately I can't do anything about, but secondly because I have those conversations with her, with them, about being the only girls, etc., etc. So it is hard and actually unfortunately in schools um, it is not, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be, but it definitely still there. So just, just a small comment. I guess my question was more maybe directed to our not in the sense of um, financial su sustainability of sports. We believe that this is very, very important to do in any sport to actually, um, you know, obviously what we're doing here is incubating it, but at the end, what's going to make the sport successful is to have an audience, to have, you know, make it um, sustainable. So my question is really, why is there such a big separation between tournaments in football, between the men's and the women's tournaments, like we look at tennis and the tournaments happen at the same time. And I think that would be a huge opportunity, something that FIFA could do to actually increase the exposure of uh, women's football if we could actually have more joint tournaments. I don't know what you think about that. Thank you. It's an interesting concept. It was, uh, I think, part of David Ginola's uh, bid for, uh, for the leadership, wasn't it? He said, why don't we put the teams together? I'm not sure he particularly thought about the logistics of how you get 24, which I'm, mm. I'm thinking might be one of the key reasons why they're kept separate. Um, from a broadcast point of view, could you imagine having a, a men's and women's I don't think it is very necessary, to be honest. I think uh, you see, uh, and President Blatter said that earlier, we have this World Cup, female World Cup this year, and all the efforts, the marketing, the communication is concentrated on that event. If you mix the two, okay, you will get benefit um, once you're there, but I'm, afra I'm afraid that the, the, you know, the male intensity would cannibalize the, the, the female tournament. So I think now women's football is, is, can be proud of what it, what it is and uh, it can really be, be on, its, on its own with its own events. Uh, logistically, that would be a nightmare to organize. After that, from time to time, you can do some specific things. Uh, I don't know if you have a, a, a cup final. Why not having the, the, the you know the female game as an opening? Uh, why not? Why not? That could create some kind of buzz. But beyond that, I don't think it's necessary to to bundle the two competitions. No, I, I don't know what you feel. So one-off promotional opportunities where you're bundling them together, great to, to raise the profile. But I think if you want women's football to become a standalone business in its yeah. own right, rather than relying on money from men's football um, to try and develop the game longer term um, and generate, you need to, you know, we need to bring in our own broadcast deals, our own commercial partners to drive the game forward and give women's football its own space, really, to, to, yeah. for the world to... You know, spotlight on it. But use opportunities mm. where you can. This year in Brazil, we were able to actually, and, and Moya was at the media conference, um, it was the first time the Women's World Cup had a profile at the Men's World Cup, and we, we unveiled our official poster, and we had the mascot from Brazil and the mascot from Canada on stage together. For the very first time, two mascots were on stage together. And it was, it was a really neat moment. And, mm. and that was a great opportunity for us to tell the great story within the context of the Men's World Cup without trying to compete with it, yeah. to be honest. Um, and it was the right time to do that. So that, for that situation, I think it, it was a good opportunity. Do we have anybody in the auditorium who markets women's football at a club out of interest? Anybody at a club? Could you please give us your perspective on the challenges <laughs> of 
promoting women's football and your club in particular and how, about, how you go about doing it. Can I ask where you come uh, from? I will tell you about the 26 clubs in, in the highest league in, in Sweden. Then. So, uh, but I'm the general secretary for, for the Swedish women's leagues, uh, Dalmasanskan, that Rebecca was talking about. And uh, we are part of the Swedish federations. We're not like in a, a league association. It's very important to say because we've got other values and not commercial. But it's really important, uh, like what we're talking about, is often when we sit in this room, we, we talk about that we have to tell our own story. We have to, to sell our own values. But when we came outside, and we don't want to co compare with men's football, but when we came outside, it's so easy to do the copy paste of the men's football. If you see in Sweden at the 12 clubs and in the elite of Damasenskan, they have their own media contract since 2007. Because of their own values, because of their own story, yeah, it's a really, really hard work, of course, and we have lots of <laughs> other things to deal with, like spectators, economic, of course. But we have done the work, and I think it's really important to see it from the, from the clubs. Um, what we have done, um, if you see in Europe, in England, in Germany, France, and uh, Sweden, Norway, for example, that there's a hard work to do it, but I think we need to have our own values, even outside these uh, walls. So we can also talk to Eurosport, or we can talk to other sponsors, mm -hmm. and that is uh, the high value to, to invest. invest in the women's football, like Moya said, that we need to be proud of our, and that's a really, really hard work in, in the Sweden for, for the clubs. Uh, so often they, they fell down because they don't feel to be proud because we only get like 800 on a match, and another week we get 5,000 on a match. And then you're proud, so you really have to be, to be there and push and push and push because we are the natural sport in, in Sweden and also in Europe. So it's really, I think we need to be more proud of our own football, and that we can also be show our uh, passion outside this world, and not only to ourselves, and mm -hmm. also that we can need uh, use each other to work each other. What have we done in, in Sweden uh, that can do in Spain or Serie uh, Mione? We also have been there from from the beginning, and we are a young sport in football if you look at it in a professional way. So. I don't know if that was the, the, mm. the, the question. Yeah, you, you also have your own home stadium for women's football, don't you, in Gothenburg? Yeah, we have it also. We have the license for the arenas. To does that work for you, that you play all or most of your women's games in one place so that the local community yeah, yeah, for the know where you are? Team, yeah. It's not in, in the same arena as the, the men's. But if you see the final of the Euro 2013, we said we're going to have 30,000 at the French arena. And people are laughing, of course. 30,000 in the final on the Women's Euro. No way. And uh, we had Norway against Germany. No Sweden in, in uh, the final, as you know. And uh, we had over 40,000. We have to open it up. And as I said, I really like to meet those that uh, laughed from us, uh, to us <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, but that was uh, the only, um, only time when we were playing in a men's national arena. Uh, but for the national team, it's very important to have, and also for the clubs, to have their own uh, facilities in their own arenas. Okay. So, anybody, thank you very much for that contribution. Anybody else in the auditorium like to ask a question before I go to another one on Twitter? Yes, at the back there. Would you like to tell us your name and where you're from, please? And then we'll be finished in just the next four or five Hi, minutes. My name is Anata. I'm from Adopt a Fan from Brazil. Um, I just wonder what is really being done in terms of understanding the viewers and the consumers of women's football? Because so far we said a lot about is it nice, is it not nice, do we want to make our own product, etc. But obviously, Moya gave the excellent example of going to the supermarket and having several options. But you also have several options because you buy different things, because you have different interests. So I wonder how much do we really know about these consumers and what they are doing and how are we reaching them uh, as well. Um, I've no said before about the brands and then spending money in uh, men's football. Is it the same brand that interests both? Is it the same viewer that's actually buying both? 
Um, Brazil World Cup had local sponsors who had complete failures in their promotions because exactly they promoted uh, things for women to do during the matches because obviously only, match, only men go to the matches and those were complete failures uh, nationally. So, I mean, that's to sum up my question, that, that is it. Do we know who are the consumers? What, how much work has been done exactly to target these viewers? Thank okay. you. What market research has been done on the actual viewers of women's football? From a viewership point of view, actually, um, that wouldn't be me. Because <laughs> it's more so, I, I think Arno could probably answer that better. But I would just say that, I mean, we talked about it a little bit earlier, the, 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 female, um, the female game is more of a family demographic, but not necessarily at the World Cup level per se. Um, and so we're reaching those individuals, but it's the, it's the responsibility of the media rights licensees around a World Cup, for example, to tell that story and to engage that viewer. So it's, it's our responsibility, say, as, as hosting the tournament to, to have uh, stories that we can tell, but it's also a collective effort with FIFA uh, to do that, and we regularly do do that. So we try to tell the story, and, but you can't lose sight of the fact that you have to be proactive about it. Nobody's coming to you asking you about your story. You have to go out and tell them your story. And, and in the women's game, you have to work harder at that than you do in the men's game. In the men's game, the phone rings, and in the women's game, you make the call. That's just the easiest way to look at it. And if you're not aggressive and proactive about it, your story will not get told. And so that's what, as, as an, um, I, that's kind of the difference for me between our two, and, I, and I've said I've qualified in Canada, it's a little bit different, and we're very fortunate, but only because we've had success and we've become relevant. Before that happened, we were much more aggressive, but, and we still continue to be. We still have to work hard to get people to tell our story. We don't take it for granted, and if we, don't, if we are not proactive in our PR efforts, nobody will know what we're doing. If you don't tell them, they don't know, right? So maybe Kelly, one of you. Briefly, do you know yeah. what people want? Um, well, really quickly, we've got uh, customer insight team at the FA, um, they've helped us to make sure that we understand who our fans are and who's most likely to attend. We track their customer experience, right from how they find out about a game, mm -hmm. their experience the whole way through it. Um, the clubs alongside ourselves have ratings in terms of customer experience so we can try and drive those up and obviously we really need to understand frequency frequency of coming to those games, what's going to drive people back on a regular basis and marketing initiatives to drive that. So okay. it's a and Arno, to finish the last word? On the broadcaster side, uh, I don't think you're targeting different people. As I said, 80% of the people watching women football in Europe are men. Uh, it's just a sponsor uh, start now to be interested in different stories. Uh, and this is something that uh, we repeated a lot this morning, you know, and uh, we have dif you have different personalities in women's football. You have authenticity, you have freshness, proximity, accessibility. Uh, uh, some, it's, it's really a fresh air for football. That's why it's so important. So sponsors start to be interested in that. Uh, of course, with male football, they will have strong impact, uh, massive campaigns. Uh, it's another dimension, but not necessarily exactly the same way of living football. Uh, so that's for the podcaster part, but, but of course this is a work in progress. As far as sponsors of, of a league or a federation, you have, I think you had three different periods. 10 or 15 years ago, the, you were telling them, okay, you have the males sponsorship, and by the way, we give you the female, you know. Yeah. What can I do about that? I don't care about it. That was the first period. Second period, it's right now where we are. You have the males. You have the female team too, and now they're, they're, they're happy about that, and I want to activate also on the, on the you know, female teams, women football. I think the next period would be, uh, I'm interested in women's football, or I'm interested in men's football, but I want to activate differently, not necessarily bundle the two, and tell different stories uh, with both of the, of, the, of the disciplines. That may be the next step, I think. Okay, thank you very much to all our panellists. Uh, thanks to Isha, to Sandra, to Kelly, to Moya, and to Arno. Uh, that's it for the moment. We are going to uh, see a little video in a minute that Arno has put together for us. But please do come back at just before two o'clock when we'll be hearing from Hope Powell, and then we'll be hearing from Dr. Petra Janser, and then we're going to have our second uh, panel debate, which will be women in leadership. So thanks very much to everybody. We'll see you shortly. And this is from Arno and Eurosport. <laughs> <laughs>